All right. Okay. Welcome back to the channel. I'm Hank Strange. We are live in the Big Daddy Gun Studio. That's right. And tonight we have special guests. Check this out. Look at that. Reed Henricks, Valor Ridge, Patriot Nurse. Man, this is going to be fun. This is going to be fun. What's up, guys? Hey, dude. Just happy to be here, man. Glad to hang out and talk with you again. I know we'll be hanging out again this fall soon, but I'm yep. just glad to be here on the 4th of July, and happy 4th of July to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, man. Um, um, this, is, this is a lot of fun. I always look forward to talking to you. Oh, same here. Same yeah. here. We always have a good time. Absolutely. You know, I think the last time we had a nice long conversation, we were around the fire. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that beautiful. Yeah, man. Huh? Beautiful weather is in the fall. I think you came in October. Yeah, it was beautiful out there. It was just us and the stars. Very romantic. Yeah. <laughs> Literally, yeah I've, I've obviously, obviously. Yeah. This is the people of the show, is it not? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, you know, we could, this is, uh, this is rated whatever, <laughs> you know? So, um, Definitely, we, we've got Patriot Nurse. She'll be in and out, I guess, uh, dropping a few things on on us. We we would definitely like to invite her to come on the show, but right now, we'll mostly be hanging out with our buddy Reed. All right. You guys, I don't know, you know, you guys should be that like, Reed. What's your channels? What's the YouTube channels that you've got going? Is it Valor Ridge? No, I just this is my first and last name. Reed Henricks is my channel. Um, oh, okay, and that's it. Nothing special. Right. What about social media? We were talking about this behind the scenes. <laughs> uh, I think that it's limited to Facebook, and I only do it because of business. I like showing like pictures of the class or like news articles. It's just Reed Hendricks at Valor Ridge. So okay. no, no like dynamic explosive response or anything like that. It's just my name. Look at that. You should see the look that Rachel's giving you. I know you're just trying to be <laughs> mysterious, right? Oh yeah, you go clearly as, as uh, high speed as possible. <laughs> yeah, you know, you sometimes you seem like such a nerd, and then if folks saw like we were really, it was a battle behind the scenes to get this to uh, get this to go. But I'm glad we got it up and running. Yeah, absolutely, man. I'm glad to. If we get enough time, we'll figure it out. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I know there's some folks who are behind the scenes and everything. Uh, definitely ask us questions. Lola is also here in the background, and she will pass on questions and stuff like that to me. Um, first of all, Reed, do you want to just tell us a little bit about who you are and what is Valor Ridge? Oh, sure, man. Um, you know, we, what we do at Valor Ridge, we teach everybody, you know, in pistols and rifles how to protect themselves and their family. You know, um, my background is military. I was in the Marine Corps. I was an infantryman. I was an old 351 anti-tank assaultman. Um, also did uh, law enforcement as well. I was on some I did like undercover narcotics and vice and patrol and also part of a task force sent down to New Orleans for Hurricanes Katrina and Rita. So also a lot of, of commercial firearms training as well. It's been a fun filled 18 years, man, a lot jam packed into, into amount of time. So it's just like the 32nd, you know, summary of everything, but we train everybody, police, military, you know, regular folks just out there varying experience levels. If you've never shot before, or even if you shot quite a bit, you know, we, we, uh, we train everybody to buy, despite their experience or skill level. Yeah, that's what I like about you, man. You're really deep, you know, on the on the front of it, on the face of it, if you just look, you know. You see a, a rough and rugged kind of easygoing guy, but if you really dig in, um, I find you to be deep. You've also got a pretty good education. You want to tell folks out there what kind of education you have? Oh, man, I just I just wrote all the papers and said all the smart words and I broke out the thesaurus all the time, but... No, I, uh, I got a, a bachelor's in you know, science and history and also uh, uh, social science and history education as well. Master's in history and uh, completed all my coursework for my doctorate. Um, oh, I just don't want to pay $15,000 to write a 200-page paper. That's all. Um, I don't you know. don't want to be Dr. Reed? No, I mean, if, if it's in the titles and stuff, but I mean, really what I want is to go do like law school and then people would have to call me Esquire. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah. That oh, sounds like Bill and Ted. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That, you, you, you're the only one who's ever got that. Man. I know. The only one who's ever got that. That's, those are my favorite movies, man. Oh, yeah. Very cool. So, um, so give us a little bit of background of what goes on at Valor Ridge training. I know you touched on it a little bit, but for folks out there that don't know anything, what and where is Valor Ridge? Because I think one of the really, really cool things about it, other than the fact that you're there, is the location. It's really beautiful. Oh, thank you. I know we had a lot of fun. Um, well, we're in the Cumberland Gap area. It's a three-state area. We're in Tennessee, but we're literally like five minutes from the Virginia border. 
about 10 minutes from Kentucky. So it's where Kentucky, Virginia, and Tennessee meet. It's the uh, Cumberland Gap. And if you know history in that, it's where Daniel Boone spent a lot of his time crossing uh, through the mountain pass. And it's a historical area. You know, it's it's a beautiful place. It's in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. Um, pretty good terrain and uh, just a just a traditional place, you know. And, and it's, you know, we found it to be perfect for what we want to do, which is train people how to defend themselves. Okay. So when it comes to um, training, I know you've done lots of different training in lots of different places. You want to touch on that real quick? I know I've had a few different trainers on here. Um, yeah. Of all sorts oh sure so, yeah yeah um i train with like pretty much almost anybody you can think of uh, over the last few years and there's really good ones in that but um you know some guys that that i really look up to the like guys that have been that have really been selfless when it comes to you know giving advice and you know, some of these guys have been doing it for a long time like 20 years I think some people longer than that mm -hmm. and it's amazing like how how generous and how uh well, the word i'm trying to find is like how just how much tact and how much poise that they have just just absolute like gentlemen by every meaning of that word you know guys like paul howe at combat shooting and tactics down in texas guys like bill rogers and rogers shooting school and uh ella j georgia you know guys like that i mean the guys that really helped uh develop you know a lot of how i teach and, and some of the drills that we do as well but they're guys that they're getting older i don't know how much longer they're going to be doing it so it's kind of depressing because all the guys that know all the good stuff are retiring, you know, or at least looking to retire within the next year or so. So mm -hmm. then you got this huge gap, you know, you got this huge gap of trainers and it's like um, kind of scary in a way because, I mean, I know they're always going to be around for advice, but it's like. Um, wow. Are we really, are we really on the cusp of that? Cause I never thought of that. That's kind of scary to think. Yeah. In my, these... opinion, we are. You know, in, my, in my opinion, we are. I mean, there's, there's so much, there's so much gimmicky crap, man. Like all this flashy whiz bang stuff. It just never works. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, it, and it's like, I don't, I don't, I don't think that's very practical, you know? And, um, I, I just really, there's a huge gap in there and I, what I try to do is fundamentals. You know, it's all about fundamentals and practical stuff that people have actually used in gunfights, you know, not this theoretical, like fancy words. And, you know, it's just, it's just not, it's, you're not helping anybody doing that kind of thing. And, but guys like, like Bill and, and Paul Howe, you know, those guys know it cause they, they've, They've been there. They've done that kind of stuff. You know, I mean, Bill was an FBI agent. He came up. I don't know if people don't know this about him, but he came up. He didn't come up with he he demonstrated clearly to the FBI in 1980 the superiority of aimed uh, sighted fire over point shooting. The FBI was teaching point shooting as late as 1980, 1981. So what's the what's the difference be, uh, between those two? Just to, you know. Oh, uh, the difference is okay. So, like point shooters, I, I mean, I've I've read, I mean, I've read all the point shooters. I mean, I've read Fairbairn and Sykes. You know, these guys were in Shanghai from the early 20th centuries. I've read like the Rex Applegate, you know, who was in World War II and taught this stuff. Uh, moving on, you know, guys like Michael Yanich, you know, that teach point shooting and things like that. And they're good people, man. I mean, they're good shooters. But you know, point shooting is like you just raise the pistol to your eye level without using your sights, and you and you you count on your um, body alignment to put the rounds, you know, where they're supposed to go. But that doesn't work against people that are moving. It doesn't work against small, obscured, like hostage targets. And it really breaks down past seven yards. Okay, and so that, think, that's kind of like the more intuitive. Uh, well, they'll call it intuitive, but nobody's born with a pistol in their hand out of their mother's womb. So it can't be, you know? Um, so it's like, it's, it's like what I, what I find people intuitive is just like they've repeated that over and over and over again and then call it instinct or call it whatever, but it's not. It's just, it's, it's poor practice. Um, like this has been proven to be inferior to sighted fire on every level. And people will say, well, it's faster than sighted fire. Well, Bill Rogers would disagree. Bill Rogers students would disagree. I mean, we were hitting uh, headshot size plates at 10 yards in a half of a second. It doesn't get much faster than that, you know? Um, and, and it's like, so he, but just to show like his influence on the industry and his influence on people, I mean, he's been doing this like 35, 40 years. Yeah. And he, he is, uh, just an amazing shooter. He's 70. I don't want to give away his age, but let's just say he's <laughs> he's 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 a seasoned citizen. He's okay? an old dude. Old dude. He's, he's, I like seasoned. You know, he's a seasoned. Seasoned. Citizen. seasoned. Okay. Yeah. But he'll still step up to the line and uh -huh. outshoot just about anybody on the planet. I mean, I saw him on the first day of class on his range. He did 123 out of 125 cold with bronchitis. Wow. He's just an incredible shooter and, and just a, every bit of a, of a gentleman. I can't speak highly enough of him and his cadre. Guys like Kyle Armstrong, Billy Lumpkin, uh, Ronnie Dodd, um, Davey, 
you know, all those guys out there, they're solid people. And just, and it's just, a, a, he's a guy I really look up to and Paul House the same way, you know, those, those yeah. guys really know how to bring it. Well, it's good to know that some of that's getting passed on to you, at least as a trainer. So, you know, that will keep going out there. I know when you, when you were talking about that, it reminded me of when we went to the FBI Trading Academy at Quantico and I did see these old pictures of how they used to shoot. <laughs> Oh yeah, it's even worse than that, you know. I mean, there's some pictures of them shooting from the hip. Oh yeah, yeah, and that's straight up Fairbairn and Sykes. I mean, that that goes back. That's turn of the 20th century in Shanghai, and they'll say, "Oh, we, you know, these gunfights take place in low light and alleys, and it's close range." And, mm -hmm. and it's like, okay, that's great, but now we have flashlights. Yeah, yeah, and it's you not know? trying to. I'm not trying to knock shooting from the hip because I oh. think even you, you, um, I know I've done I've done at least the um, the basic handgun training with you, and you there is a purpose to shooting from the hip, right, under certain circumstances. Oh uh, well, you you could, but I mean, like we teach even better. We teach a contact, you know, pulling the pistol back so you have ma maximum control. So it's not like shooting from the hip per se. It's uh, you can still aim it. And, I mean, we demonstrate to the students that you can make. Uh, good spinal column shots. I mean, high centered vitals, thoracic cavity hits even out to three to five yards. Um, if you're practicing, get used to what's going on. So you can do it. But I mean, really the only practical purpose for it is if somebody can reach out and grab your gun. Like I don't want somebody reaching out and grabbing my gun. I want it close to me. So mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of different things about it. But um, yeah, the older people, I mean, the older stuff that they were teaching, hip shooting and all this and that, um, people have found that sighted fire is superior to it in every way, and not only in terms of accuracy, but in terms of speed, it's a wash. Yeah. Uh, no, if there's no advantage in speed, then why would you use it when you're sacrificing accuracy? And um, I just, you know, I think that, you know, when he, he proved it, he actually shot against their big time point shooter at the FBI Academy and ended up smoking him pretty bad. Okay. Um, yeah, so it was, it was, it was. But, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like just shows you that you, it's never too fast to use your sights. There's always time to use your sights. And, and there are two types of shooters, those that use their sights and make hits and those that don't. Right. So And there's definitely an evolution over time. I mean, and we're still evolving to things. And I think some of those guys out there that do some of the super fantastical ninja stunt stuff that you're talking about would say that that's what they're trying to do. But I think there's there should be a, a happy uh, medium or balance between that because you don't want to go over the heads of people and not not only give them like, um, you know, bad information, but information that's going to wind up getting them or other people they didn't want to hurt hurt. Yeah, man, it's it's kind of like really, I mean, there's there, nobody's I mean, there's really nothing new. Like there's not there's not going to be this new stuff. It's kind of like um, I mean, what, how are you going to reinvent fundamentals? Mm -hmm. you either line your sights up if you have a good sight picture or you don't. Yeah, unless, um, we, unless we totally reinvent the gun. I don't know what that's right. going to be. That's not happened in a long time. Yeah, I don't see heat-seeking ammunition coming into play anytime soon, you know? So it's kind of like um, you know, we're still going to have to execute geometry. Like we're still going to have to put the sights where they need to go. We're still going to have to move the trigger without disturbing the sights and all that stuff. Like I don't know how it could be any different than anything else. It's just uh, – you know, I like setting the bar pretty high for people. Like that's why we use small targets. You know, we use uh, drills that you know teach a variety of different skills. And it's kind of like, um, you know, you got to set your bar high. You know, you got to set your bar high because the best that I know, like the best shooters that I know, guys that that either shoot for a living or guys that uh, that go on real missions for a living. I mean, do dangerous things. Uh, they'll all tell you the same thing, that, that being high speed is, is nothing more than executing the fundamentals on demand, executing the basics on demand. And um, I'm a big believer in that. You know, there's, there's nothing flashy about any of this stuff. It doesn't look sexy or cool like in the movies. Um, you know, it's just basically you, know, you got to execute your fundamentals at speed or execute your fundamentals so that you can have accuracy. And that's, that's really all it's going to ever boil down to. I mean, I was talking with Clint Smith one day and you know, we were just having a discussion about fundamentals and he says, man, it's, it's like fundamentals is the only thing that's ever won gunfights. And I was like, yeah, man, I, I wish I could convince people of that. Yeah. So we, well, we want, you know, man, uh, listen, some things get people into the game, right? Or some people, some things get people to start thinking about this. Quite often it's movies, right? So you're, yeah. you're going up against either movies or things that people did when they were kids. Sure that have kind of stuck in their mind. How do you, I, I know we've discussed this before, so what's your philosophy on this? Because I think you kind of look at it as a martial art. You want to explain that? Yeah, I look at it as a martial art. There's a lot of crossover. You know, I mean, we've trained a lot of cool guys. 
you know, that have been pretty high level martial artists, whether it's Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, some Greco Roman wrestlers, you know, some really cool people. I mean, guys that, uh, that compete at the highest levels, you know, mm -hmm. um, guys that like, if you got on the mat with them, like you'd last about five or six seconds tops, mm -hmm. you know, and that's probably insulting to them. It'd probably be less. You right. know? Me, me, it's not, I'm, you know, it's, it's going to be a lot faster than that. Yeah. yeah. I'd be like, I would be like, like, you know, an animal in a boat because I can't feel my legs, you know, but, um, but they, but they'll all say there's a lot of crossover to it because there's certain things that you got to do. I mean, you have to have fundamentals. Uh, you got to have your foundation. You got to have your building block. You know, people want to uh, sometimes build houses without having a proper foundation. You, know, you look at um, different, I mean, look at musicians. I know you like music. I know that you have the history of working with, with musicians. Right. Um, look at musicians. Why is it that um, some of the best musicians in the world were rooted in the fundamentals of music theory, such as knowing the chords, knowing the scales, they practice scales. And why is it that they can improvise so well? Why do you think that some of these jazz artists uh, like Miles Davis, you know, why could he do so well? Because I can guarantee you that he knew scales front and back before he started ad-libbing, before he started to do that. Yeah, he so had with, it really drummed into him. Exactly. And with yeah. firearms, it's, it's really the same thing. Uh, you've got to be rooted in, in your fundamentals. You've got to have your proper draw. You've got to know what a proper sight relationship looks like at various distances. You've got to know how to manipulate the trigger without disturbing the sights and how to grip the handgun uh, so that it's firm in your hands. You've got to know how to clear your leather and, and get on it and use both hands, you know, your right hand or your left hand. Um, you know, you've got to know all these things um, before you can really start to uh, to operate those kind of things at speed. But even when you're operating it at speed, you're not really changing what you're doing you're just eliminating inefficient movements right like you'll see some people reloading and they'll do all you know all this stuff and it's like moving their heads moving the guns moving the magazine is moving but all you got to do is bring it up and put it in and go yeah. i but, think for you i think if people are looking on the outside that you might look like you're going fast but to you you're probably not you're no. pro it, you know uh what is it what is it that einstein said something about relativity and speed and how it looks based on what perspective you're looking at it from yeah, it, it's it's not. And then, like when you practice enough, like you realize even even a uh, even something like one quarter of a second, 0.25 seconds, right? When you get to the point you practice that much, you you feel that feels like an eternity. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's like it's like wait a minute, that felt so slow, or oh, I really got it fast on that one. And it's only a quarter of a second difference. And so to other people, it looks fast, but to us, it's like we feel, uh, you know, we feel it if it's fast or slow. So. Uh, but that just comes through repetition and, and, and is constantly drilling your fundamentals. I mean, every week, um, you can ask Patriot nurses, I am I am handling my firearms every day, right? Mm -hmm. Handling them every day. She she. It's true. <laughs> I'm handling because we're doing reloads. You know, we're doing uh, stoppage clearances. It's we're doing, very distracting during a movie on date night. It, <laughs> that's part of the date it, is, it is. It is part of the date night. Like, like, okay, I'm glad to know you're not the only one that does that. <laughs> it's, it's perfectly normal, you know. Uh, yeah. And guys out there, if you're watching this, like life's too short to date girls that don't like firearms, man. Yes, I mean, amen, brother. Amen. I mean, there's too many of them that do. There's too many yeah. of them that want that stuff. Yeah. You know? um, if she's not into guns, that's the first bad sign. That, yeah. along with like when you open the door for her and let her in, you know, does she open the door for you or not? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's, there's these all these signals. The more experience that you get, the more like goes and no goes yeah. that we have. It's kind of like pistol stands. Yeah. Either go or no go. You know, yeah, so, uh, I know it's. I know it seems to guys out there. I mean, we're we're off track a little bit on the subject of relationships. And I talk to a lot of gun guys, and some of them tell me, "Man, it's kind of kind of lonely, kind of tough out there to find someone who believes in the Second Amendment, believes in guns, like I do." And I say, "Okay, it, it might be tough, but keep looking because I'm not compromising." Oh, yeah, you know, I mean, I didn't even find. You know, I mean, you gotta think, man. I mean, I'll, I'll be I'll be 36 next month. It's like hard to believe, you know. Uh, but I didn't. And I waited 34 years, you know, before I found, you know, the person I'm supposed to be with, you know, and she's awesome. She can shoot, man. Yeah. Like she, she can, I mean, she's out of the holster at the end of the target, like in no time. I was like, wow, that's solid. You know I mean? She, she'll surprise you with how fast yeah. she is. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, life's too short to deal with, with the kind of people that, that aren't into the firearms. I mean, there's compromises on certain things like the toilet seat and, you know, there's compromise on like the hairball and the shower. Yeah, and maybe, or what side of the paper, like, do you have the paper hanging down or flipped over? I'm exactly. Hang like, yeah, I'm a hanging the, down guy. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, I mean, it's all negotiable, but what's not yeah. negotiable is like the guns in the house. You know what I mean? Right. Um, 
people are going to be like, well, you know, it's like, you know, we got kids. Great. All the more reason to have them in the house. Okay. How about to keep them on your body? Did you ever think about that instead of leaving it in the drawer on top of the, you know, on top of the dresser? How about just putting the pistol in the holster and wearing it? Because if you get disarmed by your kid, you probably shouldn't have a gun to begin with. Yeah. So, and, um, and, and, you know, the place that you feel the most safe and comfortable is where you're the most vulnerable at. So you should always have something on your body. I know I do when I'm in the home, when I'm at home. Speaking of home, how's the Hacienda? Oh, it's great, man. You got to come out there. You still haven't come out to the Hacienda. It's hot and humid right now. <laughs> I, I've this heard is, in Florida it's hot and humid in the summer. Yeah, yeah. It's a, this magical thing that happens. But we were out there, um, what, what's today? Today's Tuesday. We were out there on Sunday all day. I'm all bitten up. You probably can't see it, but I've got like bug bites all over. I mean, Florida is really, uh, it's the jungle, my friend. <laughs> it is. Yeah, hopefully we'll... Uh, I'd, I'd love to come down and yeah. I, and you have a, a proud moment in your life, didn't you? This uh, fall, this this fall semester of school. Yes, my up? my son, my son, angst. We call him angst strange, and that angst is actually his name, believe it or not. And he went off to college. He goes to FSU now. <laughs> so, yeah, man. Yeah, that's, that's pretty awesome. awesome. Yeah, I'm so you know when uh, we were talking about kids and and when my first son came along, this happened with the second one as well. But with him, it really like sunk home to me. I was like, wow, you know, everything changes from here, and I'm responsible for these lives. And there's so many things I need to teach them and do to to raise them up. And I'm like, it, it's a huge deal for me that he's 18 years old now. He just turned 18. He's off in college and. You know, he's on the way. And then we've got his brother, you know, he's right behind. We'll be kicking him out pretty soon, too. <laughs> what are you all, and you're going to have, then you're going to have the place all to yourselves. Yeah. Then I could walk around instead of them walking around pretty much naked. Now oh, I could man. do it. Yeah. Cause you see, for some weird reason, it's my house, but they can walk around with like almost no clothes on, but I can't do that. So, <laughs> so, you know, I mean, that's how it goes. All right. So Lola is telling me that we should have a little bit of discussion because I know there's some questions and things like that coming in. And Lola okay. says, like, you're a history buff. So she wants to get your take on the 4th of July since we're doing this is 4th of July show. Sure. So hit us with it, man. Yeah. Um, this is a, this is a very cool holiday. You know, it's, it's, it should be celebrated across this country and it, it should be, very near and dear to everybody's uh, heart because, you know, the 4th of July, you know, to me is the very, it's a shifting moment in not only just U.S. history, but in world history, right? Mm -hmm. It's like the one of the first times in the history of the world where a country was birthed with the idea that rights come from God as opposed to a king or a ruler of some type, right? And uh, and and not just that. I mean, your rights are are uh, are given to you by the Creator who created heaven and earth, the laws of the universe, natural law that you that you're endowed by your Creator. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I mean, think mm -hmm. about how radical of an idea that was during that time period when all the other countries and mo most of the other countries on Earth. They thought their rights were granted by government, you know, by uh, some ruler that that they that they just picked up the scraps off of their table. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 incredibly radical. But I mean, even t not only then was it obviously incredibly radical hundreds of years ago. But I mean, I think it's radical today, man. H how many places around the world do we have this crazy experiment that we have going on going on? It's it's very rare, and you know there's there's all kinds of people that want to try to, you know, uh, change the narrative and offer you know this revisionist history and, but I mean take taking people back to the Fourth of July or just 1776 early July you know the vote on July second you know that's when it was actually adopted but July fourth uh, you know when we think about that that came at a time when you know it didn't. You know the things weren't going that well uh, for for the you know United States. And it was actually not even the United States back then. It was the you know mm -hmm. thirteen colonies. Um, you know they 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 were been fighting for a long time. You know for their uh, what they wanted was a restoration of their rights as Englishmen. You know a lot of the people enlisted in the Continental Army, taking you know to King George the mm Third. -hmm. You know people don't remember that. They don't think about that. They think that it was like the Declaration of Independence and the Revolution started. No, it was the Revolution had been had been fought for a long time, well over a year uh, before a Declaration of Independence was even brought into into account. 
Um, you know, you think about the, the men on the committee, Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, uh, I mean, incredible human beings. Um, Jefferson was 33 years old when he wrote the Declaration of Independence. Wow. And um, for back then, I mean, you know, that that's a completely different age than it would be today, right? It, it was, but Jefferson was a pretty smart guy. I mean, he spoke many languages. You know, um, mm. rumor has it that he could write in one language with his right hand and in another language in his leg, left hand simultaneously. Wow. Um, okay. Yeah, so he's he's a pretty smart guy. He's an architect. I mean, just brilliant. But he, um, you know, he he was wide read, widely read in in many of the ancient philosophers. But one of the uh, one of his favorite people that he liked to uh, study was John Locke. Um, of course, Locke was one of the first people uh, to say that rights came from from God rather than government. Locke, of course, is in England, um, influential in the Glorious Revolution. Uh, very brilliant guy. Second treatise on government should be mandatory reading for everybody out there. Uh, to see where we get a lot of our political genesis from. Right. Uh, but Jefferson borrowed borrowed he uh, heavily from Locke with the Declaration of Independence. But, uh, you know, one of the banners that the, the, the soldiers used to fly during the Revolution was a white flag with a green, evergreen tree that said an appeal to heaven. And that came from Locke's second treatise on government when he said that, uh, that when people, I'm paraphrasing, of course, isn't verbatim, uh, okay. but when people uh, petition their government for redress of grievance and it's not answered or it's not, uh, and this, you can't re you cannot uh, reconcile things that you have no other recourse but an appeal to heaven, mm -hmm. and uh, that's an amazing thing when you think about their their yeah. life. And if you think about it, I mean, we all have the, like you know this is such a complicated thing. I don't think they teach it enough in school here. I know I definitely didn't get enough. Um, there was a lot of things going on with America and why England was exerting pressures on America the way it was. Right? I mean, basically, I think it was based on our natural resources yeah. that that were here. Um, that's part of it for sure. You know, they also, a lot, what a lot of people don't remember about this also is that Britain had incurred a massive amount of debt uh, from the French and Indian War, also called the Seven Years' War. That was the most costly war in their history, and they had actually doubled their national mm -hmm. debt uh, fighting that war to beat France and in other countries as well. But um, they, they were heavily in debt. They couldn't tax their own citizens anymore. Their own citizens were already heavily taxed. And they said, well, if we keep raising taxes on our citizens, we probably won't get reelected, you know, the House of Commons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, there was a lot of parallels kind yeah. of to what we have going on today. Yeah, there, there's similar there's similar rever reverberations for sure. But I mean, you had other things as well. I mean, you, you have uh, the colonists that, that were culturally different from people in Britain. I mean, these were people that carved their own way of life out of the wilderness. I mean, these were people that, you know, had had some similar customs, but but a lot of different customs as well. I mean, you look at uh, the, the major colonies back then, Virginia and Massachusetts. I mean, Massachusetts was started, uh, you know, in the early 1600s, uh, 1620s. You know, Virginia uh, was permanently settled in 1607 at Jamestown. I mean, these these two these two colonies took a big lead in the road to the revolution. I mean, 1765, you had the Stamp Act. You know, British taxing all paper goods in the colonies, playing cards, things like that. Patrick Henry, you know, one of the things don't people don't remember was the Stamp Act Congress in Virginia. Uh, Patrick Henry was pretty radical for 10 years before the revolution even began. Um, had a, he put forth some resolves in the House of Burgesses in, uh, in, or in, excuse me, in the Virginia legislature, this, the local assembly there. He said that uh, that basically he wanted to have an independent sovereign government in 1765. You know, ten years before, so pretty. I mean, these people took the lead in in, the, in forming that path. And so, when I think of the Fourth of July, I think about people that, you know, had nothing really to gain, uh, but everything to lose uh, when it came to signing the Declaration of Independence. Because what that is was they basically signed their own death warrant that if yeah. they were ever captured by anybody in Britain, that they would be hanged for treason. Yeah, I mean, it was a pretty gruesome death, right? I mean, from my understanding, you would be ha hung, and then they would put you in a cage and hang you up in, the, in like, uh, I don't know if it was Main Street or something, but they would leave you out there so that the, the birds could pick you apart. Yeah, that did happen. Um, that, that did happen to some uh, soldiers of, of the, not only the, the militia of the colonies, but the Continental Army. Some people were actually hanged, drawn, and quartered by the British. I mean, you talk about cruel and unusual punishment. I mean, that's... 
uh, most certainly one of those things. And so, and that was here that that happened here, or did they take anyone back to England yeah, to do this? Yes, to, yes to both. You know, yes to both. Okay. They would, uh, you know, they would take some people back to Britain, and then they'd also do some of the things in the colonies. I mean, there there's a lot of things. I mean, people think about the British as being all these honorable people, always gentlemanly, follow the rules of war. But <laughs> yeah, you had people like some dragoons, like Colonel Tarleton, who did atrocious. Uh, things to the colonies, not to mention rapes of women, uh, mentioning destruction of property. I mean, destroying entire communities, uh, harvests. And I mean, that was part of being in war back then. You know, you got to feed a standing army. Um, it's not like they had uh, MREs back then. So they had to, you know, fight, uh, fend for themselves. But I mean, there was a lot of things going on back then. And, and, and just the, the uh, people that were risking being ca and officers, I mean, Continental Army officers were uh, threatened with with death many times. I mean, there yeah, were there were it's several a lot like what you would see happening. I mean, we I know this is kind of silly, but we look at pirate movies and stuff like that, and you know, we think, you know, we see some of the things in some of these movies that they would have done to the pirates. It's a lot like that. Did I? Did we lose Reed? Uh oh. Looks like he froze up or something like that. Okay, we're gonna give him a second to join back in. Looks like he dropped out. Okay, let me see what questions we have. Looks like, um, I don't know, he dropped out for a second. So we're going to have to live TV, people. Live TV. We're getting we're getting too deep and philosophical here. So that's yeah. what happened. I'll wait for him to come back in. What what good questions yeah, do we have going on here? Mark Wagner joining. Okay, we got Mark Wagner in the house. Mm -hmm. Real cool, okay. Joe. Yeah, okay, real cool, Joe. Very cool. Uh, 904 Outdoors. 904. Oh, 904. Okay. Shout out to everyone that's there still listening. I'm going to wait for Reed. I don't even know if he's realized that he dropped out yet. Let me, um, I don't know where my phone is. Let me send him a message. He might be having a good rant right now. Um, let me send, send him a message and tell him to sign back in. Okay, so what questions do people want to know? Uh, the Independence Day was one. There is someone that wants to know about a video that Reed did called Freedom if you can keep it or something oh, for some reason okay. you can't find it. Yeah, I see he's coming back in. He's um, coming back in. But conversation is good. Let's keep it. Yeah. In. Yeah. So you dropped out there for a second, my friend. Oh, good. We're right back here. Yeah. So that's cool. All right. So I don't know where we were, but let's pick up what questions do we have? Uh, someone wanted to know about a video that Reed had going. Yeah. Let's finish that conversation. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, Reed. Finish your thought. Oh, no. I was just talking about this. There's a huge, you know, punishment there's a huge possibility of punishment of just simply fighting against the the king's troops and so these people that did this and signed the declaration of independence and not just sign it but the people in the ranks fighting were were, were well aware of the risks and they chose to do it anyway right okay i think that there's some questions out there um that someone asked you have a video called Rep republic if you can keep it mm -hmm. uh, what happened to that well i mean you know that's on somebody else's channel and they took it down so oh i see so can we get can we get you to redo that, revisit that conversation? Um, I mean, we could. It, it took a lot of research and time to do that. Uh, okay. You know, I mean, I'll try to do it uh, when I get some time. It yeah. just, you know, when I was. Because I think that was one of those videos, and that's probably why someone's asking about it here. Because, you know, sometimes you make some videos that folks refer people to over time. And I know it takes a lot of energy out of you to do it. Yeah. I, I took, I did a lot of research on that before I did it. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I, I was thinking about, you know, maybe doing it again. It's just at that time, you know, I was fresh off of teaching high school history. I was, uh, you know, used to doing that every day. You know, I mean, what you saw in that video is how I talk. What are you back. saying? What are you saying? Are you a younger man? <laughs> no, 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 no. I wasn't younger. I just, I, I, I did that instead of talking about guns every day, I was talking about history every day. So, mm -hmm. you know, it was like, um, it's one of these things where, where I mean, that's how I taught my classes in high school was what people saw in that video. You notice it was like, like an hour, hour and a half. Like that's how mm -hmm. long my blocks of teaching were when I was teaching high school. So that was a, that was a lesson uh, mm -hmm. when I used to teach. I used to talk to the kids all the time about that, the high school students. Okay. Yeah. I think, you know, if you, if you get a chance, definitely uh, come back to that. I, I think it'll be a cool thing to do. So sure. uh, what other questions do we have, Lola? Do you want to hit us up with here? Because, we, you know, we're, we're going to get deep into talking about some, stuff. Some people are asking about tactical response. Oh, okay. So um, I know that there's some people out there that are going to ask because you're here. They're going to ask about what happened with uh, the former place that you were working. Sure. 
you know. Um, do you want to address that? I know it's been some time. I don't know how you feel I mean, about I that. Taught, uh, I taught high school for, for over three years, right? Mm -hmm. And I found that they are more mature than a lot of people that uh, – that want to know about what other grown men are doing. If they want us to watch a soap opera, watch WWE. Yeah, yeah the, you know, unfortunately, here's the thing about the whole, uh, you know, the gun world. I think that we let's just put it in the in the uh, context of that, just to address it a little bit for folks out there. The gun world, what it really is behind the scenes versus what a lot of people see is a completely different thing. It's almost like there's a lot of uh, like it's some to me. I put it in the context of wrestling you know, in, in terms of wrestling not being real. So there's a lot of that going on. There's some people who are real and there's some people who aren't real. And, um, you know, and then there's folks, I think, like Reed that prefers to just stick with uh, with being positive and inspirational and, and trying to teach people and move on and that not get caught in the quagmire of all those kinds of things. Is that right? Yeah, it is. You know, and it's just basically about being professional. I mean, when you you know, when you've got morals and when you've got ethics and when you've got a different philosophy, uh, sometimes the break is inevitable, you know. Um, you know, and when you, when you think about other things as well, I mean, there's been plenty of people over the history of firearms that have, you know, started one place and, and then started their own schools. I mean, think about, you know, Clint Smith when he used to be at Gunsight. You mm -hmm. know, Jeff Cooper, he left and started Thunder Ranch, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just like people leave all the time. I mean, it's just one of those things. Um it's it's just people want to turn it into something that that is just all rumors and hearsay and that's fine but we really don't care man I don't have time yeah. to think about stuff yeah, like you know that. I got some about classes all year long yeah you know what I think I think that um, one of the things that look first of all whether you want to realize it or accept it you are kind of like a rock star uh -huh. in the gun community and I know you might not you know because you're so humble and all that kind of stuff and you might not want to really look at it that way but you are man. That's that's the reason there's there's a lot of people out there that are emotionally connected to you. And that's what's going on. And um, I know that I met you when I met you way back when, you know, I always judge everyone individually. So when I meet people, even if I meet them with a with a group of other people, I always look individually at how we interact with each other. And I think that's why, you know, we're still here talking to each other. We're still friends. That's how it goes in the world. Sometimes you meet people, you're friends, or you, or you think you're friends, and then you realize you're really just associates or something worse than that, and everyone goes about their way. And I think there's, like, room for everyone in the world to live and do their thing. Sure. And, um, you know, and it's I, – I, I get it. Like, I see why people are so connected to it because – for a lot of folks out there, this is really their world, and they really do care about all the players in it. You know, like Shakespeare said, man, all the world's a stage. <laughs> you yeah. know, and, and you and I, we're on that stage whether we like it or not. Right. You know, so I know you don't want to get into the controversy of it, but people do care about it out there. Well, the funny thing is that there is no controversy. <laughs> like, that's mm -hmm. like that's what, that's what people don't understand. There, there's no controversy. But they'll be – I mean, you know, it's just uh, – it, it, it's hilarious what people will come up with a lot of times. I mean, some people thrive on that stuff. Man. Some people thrive yeah. on controversy. They need it to stay relevant or whatever. But yeah. I'm, not trying to, I'm not one of those people, man. Um, I think, uh, you know, I'm busy working. I'm busy, I'm busy taking care of my range. I'm busy mowing the fields and the grass. I'm busy making videos for people. I'm busy keeping my own skill level up and taking classes from other from other instructors, you know, I got all, I've got too much stuff going. I'm splitting wood. I just split like two cords of wood the other day, man. I saw down a maple <laughs> and an oak tree and, um, what? you know, and, and split it up. I mean, I'm, it's yeah. like, like I'm trying to, I'm trying to like, like, uh, have a homestead on stuff. So it's a, it's a lot of fun, man. And I'm grateful yeah. for, for all the people and the students and people that, that are on the channel. Um, on people that follow on the Facebook, I'm grateful for them because, we have a lot of cool people that have come and trained with us, you know, I mean, from anywhere from doctors to attorneys to college students to mm -hmm. people that work in a kitchen, you know, people that work at restaurants, people that uh, mm -hmm. you know, are delivery drivers that save up for three, four, five months just to come to class. Like those are the people that um, that are just yeah. that are there to learn. And that's the people we really focus on. Yeah, when I come out, well, I've been one time, I'm coming again this year towards the end of the year. I don't know if you want to, like, give out when I'm coming. It's always, it's always, yeah, I don't I don't know if you even have any any room left open, but uh, when, am I, when am I going? In September, right? Yeah, so I'm going to be, is that probably the first weekend in September? Yeah, so sometime around the first weekend of September, I'll be there training with you, doing the rifle class. Um, it's always great to see the camaraderie of the people who come out there. 
you know, and all these different people getting together and realizing that they have this great thing in common. I think that's what people like about you. And, you know, like you said, you're, you know, you're, you're living a completely different life, man. You don't live in this digital world as, the, <laughs> as much as the rest of us do. <laughs> you know, you're out there cutting down real trees. Oh, We're yeah. cutting down like virtual trees, dude. Yeah. Yeah. It's, a, yeah. I mean, it's like, um, I mean, I get it. Like, I mean, we gotta, we gotta be available to people to find us and the internet's helped on a huge level. I mean, I'm glad I get to, I mean, I don't, like what people don't realize about the videos and stuff like the YouTube videos and what they don't understand is that I don't do that to sell classes. Right. Like I don't have any more classes to sell, you know? Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't do it to sell classes. So I do it because like, there's always dudes out there that they literally don't have money to come to class. Right. right? True. Because they got like, three, four, five kids, whatever. Yeah, it's tough. They have stuff. to get time off. They have to get ammo. They have to come out there. All that. It's a tough so thing, all, they've yeah. got, all they've got is five minutes of their life during the day because people are busy working, taking care of their house, taking care of their spouse, taking care of their, of their offspring. They've got all that stuff. They've got all that stuff to do, and they don't have the money to come take a class. I mean, I can't tell you how many emails I get about people. Man, I'd really love to take a class. just can't afford it, but I just want to say I support you, what you're doing. That happens all the time. And so the reason I do the videos is for people that can't come to class, at least they can take a, a useful piece of information and either um, intellectually build themselves up or build themselves up like by watching a video and like maybe using that information and going out to the range and practice. You know, that's one of the, that's the biggest reason. I, all, I'm, all I'm really seeking to do here is is to inform people and, and to get their minds working and is and constructive things you know things to watch out for like sometimes i'll, I'll be in a you know uh, uh, some you know i'll get a news story and it'll set me off maybe it's like hurtful because i see what's happening to freedom in certain states in this country like california mm -hmm. new york new jersey connecticut and it bothers me you know and so yeah i'll be a little peeved off about that and try to bring people's awareness and bring their attention to it but most of the videos are are usually gun related or or historically related. But yeah, every now and then I'll, it'll it'll go you know maybe political. Right. Yeah. Your stuff is very organic. Uh, I'm always interested in, and I guess this is something I'd like to know. Like, what's your thought process when you're making a video? I like your videos. I find them very organic and just free flowing. <laughs> you don't you don't really have an agenda, and that's the reason why I think you're successful doing what you're doing. Versus for me, I'm very deliberate. Oh um, yeah. In in what I do, my my stuff is usually more engineered. That's why I'm trying to do these conversation things so people can have a better look at my personality. I think they see my personality when I do videos, but I'm a Absolutely. filmmaker. Yeah, I'm a filmmaker and an artist, so I do a you lot are. of crafting. You know, you versus are. you're just you're just like a, you know, you're just no, like man. a real guy that gets in front of a camera and starts talking. Yeah, well well Hank, you're like uh first of all, I mean you're you're professional. I mean you 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 have a history with digital recordings you did it in the music industry as well uh, you do it with your videos I mean you built your channel from scratch which is very very impressive you know I mean I I remember meeting you when I first met you I think you had like 15,000 subscribers I mean it was it wasn't very, I mean you no, were, no no man when you first met me I think I had less than a thousand <laughs> it wasn't you wasn't a big channel and I was like no, what cool guy? But like yeah. what, what people need to know about you is like what they see is there when they see your personality, dude. You're very, very similar in real life. Easy going, like meaningful conversations and things like that. Um, when you do a video, it is deliberate. You put the time and the love into the graphics, to the camera equipment. I mean, the microphone setups. I mean, there's a lot that goes into that, you know. Yeah. And where it's, where it's like where I come up with my ideas, like here's a little secret. <laughs> I get up in the morning, uh, make patron nurse coffee. <laughs> um, that's good that's always a good don't tell Lola perfect. that don't tell her about don't let her hear about this coffee yeah, thing man it is the it is the uh, the Mayorga you know you put it in there and then you got to do the almond milk and the honey and then you got to it's, 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 it's a formula and I've got it down perfect you you're, gonna, you're, gonna, you're, gonna make, you're gonna make Lola think I've got to get up and make her coffee now <laughs> man. Hey, listen, if she comes down with you that our cover will be blown completely okay yeah I know, uh, I know. So we, you know, we do that, but then I go out and uh, so I, I make her coffee, you know, and we go and we, uh, we go to the back porch and I fire up a cigar and uh, and I think about what uh, what would be an interesting topic for a video this week. And then I write it down on, on an open. I've got like little bullet points and whatever pops in my mind that morning is what happens for that week, that video that week. Cool. That, that's the science behind it, man. Yeah. 
And how do you do your editing? I'm just, I'm just, because you know what? When I look at your videos versus Patriot Nurse, here's oh. something I notice, and I'm, this is not like a criticism because I, I, I can see the emotion and everything in your videos, and I think that's great. And I know you do, you do a lot of editing, so you cut stuff out. Yeah. And and craft it down, and it's weird. Like with Patriot Nurse, she just flows, man. She's like a one of those freestyle rappers when I watch her video. I was like, wow. Well, she's she's been going. doing it a lot longer. <laughs> Yeah, she's, you know, she's been doing it a lot longer. But she's been doing, what, seven or eight years? Yeah, seven. Seven years. Yeah. I mean, she's got a lot of videos. You know, she's yeah. made a lot of videos, a lot of, like, information. Like, what people don't know about her stuff is, like, um, you know, she's got extensive education on medicine and nursing and uh, what works, what doesn't work, fixing people. You know, she's done uh, medical missions, you know, mm -hmm. to, to places like uh, the Caribbean, Places in Indochina, you know, uh, countries. Yeah, those, that, those muscles for her have got to be really, really trained. I mean, when I watch her, I'm like, wow, this is, a, I mean, she's she's a really good lecturer. Yeah, she, she's, it's all presentation. It's professional. I mean, you know, I've, I've taken her class as well, medical prep. And, uh, you know, when, when I came out, and I'm a gun guy, you know, like all, most people are, you know, they're going to want to shoot stuff. Mm -hmm. But man, that's not, I mean, yeah, you got to defend yourself. Don't get me wrong. You got to know how to defend yourself. You got to know how to deal when the time comes. But you know, even in war zones, I mean, places like Sudan and, you know, places like uh, Rwanda, there are a lot of people killed with violence, but you know what kills more people than that stuff? Diseases and malnutrition. And, and ignorance. Exactly. They just don't, I mean, and it's like, you know, with, with her class, it's focused on, you know, taking care of yourself that way. And it's, and I was like, there's so much stuff I didn't know. And um, she actually saved my life, man. That's a, that's a hell of a story. Yeah, it's um, almost that one. Where, yeah, where, so a where? couple years ago, you know, when we, we first started dating, um, I'm, I'm a dude, you know, <laughs> so I'm not going to the hospital. <laughs> <He's> not, <laughs> like, it's, it's just it's a little boo-boo. Yeah, I'm just, I'm not going, like, you can't get me to go to the doctor. I don't want to go. I'm not going to do anything. I'll just drink water and take Motrin. Mm -hmm. you, know, you guys in the Marines know what I'm talking about. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're going to do anything. So I had a real bad fever, man. I mean, just like, hi. And, you know, my heart rate, my pulse was well over 100 resting. And I just got bad. And I just was real sick. And I felt bad. And uh, so I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go to sleep. Just go to sleep. I go to sleep all throughout the night. I'm losing fluids through various means. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I finally woke her up. I was like, I, I'm not right. She's like, okay, I'll take your vitals. So taking vitals and all this and that. And she's like, oh, my gosh, like, we need to fix this right now. So um, so we ended up – I ended up drinking, I think, about almost two gallons of, of fluid, and it was just starting wow. to come around. But I wouldn't have done that if I was by myself. You know, I'd have just been like, oh, I'm just going to go to sleep and, you know, probably Just die. <laughs> yeah, just drink beer. It would be okay. Yeah. yeah. And, like, you know, it's like – but, I mean, I'm not kidding, man. I was so dehydrated. My blood pressure was so high. You know, when she took my blood pressure, I mean, it was scary high, you know, and uh, she knew how to do all that stuff by hand. You know, I mean, she knows how to manually, I mean, all that mm -hmm. teaches all that stuff in class. And I was, uh, I was just resigned to be like, whatever, you know, when I wake up in the morning, it'll be fine. But it wouldn't have been fine, you know, so yeah. it's a miracle. So I'm very happy about that. And that's the thing about, um, you know, there's so many things. First of all, let me say this, because I know there's folks that have a bunch of questions for Patriot Nurse. So save those. We are going to have Patriot Nurse on. I don't know if she wants to come on and tell us anything now, but we'll definitely have her on. You know, she's there, but we'll have her come on and we'll do a bunch yeah. of questions. And uh, what I was going to say about that, you know, it's funny that you say that because I think it's the same thing with, with myself and Lola. And where would we be in this world without women, you know, um, a good woman? That, Not in good shape. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I would definitely be dead. What, what's she saying? She said you'd be poorly groomed and sick. Yeah, I would definitely be dead because when I first, uh, I think like, I don't know, six months or something after I met Lola is the first time when I figured out, I didn't realize I had it, but I had Crohn's disease. Oh. Yeah, and uh, and back then in those days, I mean, this is like 20, 21 years ago, um, they, they didn't really, I didn't know what was going on with me. And um, I just had these stomach problems and I literally didn't eat for, I don't know, like more than a month. I mean, I had wasted down. I think I was like 155 pounds. And um, and I was going, she was making me go to doctors and stuff. And I just didn't want to keep going. I remember telling her, yeah, I'm done. I'm not going to keep going to doctors. This is the end. But she kept pushing sure. me and, and um, you know, and saying, no, let's go. Let's find this out. Let's figure it out. And that's the reason why I'm here today. 
you know? Yeah, that's awesome, man. It's, yeah. it's incredible how that stuff happens, you know? Yeah, yeah. And that's the beautiful thing, man. To, to, I think it's worth it in life to take time, go through things, you know, when you're young and when you're going through stuff, you go through heartbreaks and all that kind of stuff. I know I went through mine. I'm sure you went through yours. You know, and it was all worth it. Uh, I wouldn't go back in my life and change anything because that one little thing I change would remove, you know, that could potentially remove Lola. And for me meeting her and being here, I wouldn't do it just for that. The butterfly effect, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, that's something we definitely have in common. And I'm sure a lot of guys out there that have the kind of, you know, powerful relationships that we do see it that way. Yeah. That's a good thing, man. It's it's a solid thing. I mean, she's been there, you know, from the very beginning. Um, you know, she was uh, actually one of the like first few people. Like, I mean, I told like maybe three or four people that um, that was what I was going to do is start start my own training company, and she was one of the first ones uh, to know about it. We 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 were friends. I mean, we. I mean, but uh, you know, we yeah. Tell us, tell us how you guys met, man. Can we can we talk about that? <laughs> well, I was I was given a. Uh, yeah, I was actually given that Republic of You Can Keep It mm -hmm. uh, speech, and she was there, mm -hmm. and she came up to me and started talking, and uh, she was, was inspired by that. I, what, were you? Yeah. Well, I, well, the first time that I heard him speak, uh, I was just very impressed. It actually reminded me the first thing that came to my mind was Jonathan Edwards and people. I mean, he was a Puritan preacher back in the day and people used to travel for miles and days to hear this man preach. And he would go for hours. He, uh, he actually a lot of kids study or at least they used to before no child left behind the sinners in the hands of the angry God. It was considered like a, a, a benchmark for, um, you know, for literary studies. But the first time I heard him talk, I thought this guy is like Jonathan Edwards. Like he when he speaks, he speaks from a, a position of like spiritual um, strength. You know, it actually reminded me of Charles Spurgeon as well. Like two really, really amazing orators, you know, like to, to read their, their works. But yeah, I was, I was inspired by that. As a matter of fact, I was. Yeah. yeah I, I don't know if you believe in reincarnation or not, but he's definitely an old soul of some sort. <laughs> well, somebody along my family line must have done something right. But uh you know, because it's not, it's not most certainly not, not any of my doing, man. I just, like I said, man, it's like, like, I can't explain how things have happened. You know, it's just one of these, these deals where like things just all happen to come into place, you know, and. Uh, so she, so she was listening to you speak. Don't try to get out of this. Oh, okay. <laughs> to you speak. So I, take it from there. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, she, I thought she was like, you know, pretty cool. I mean, I, I didn't really know much about her, you know, but mm -hmm. uh, we ended up, you know. What was your first thought? What's your, what was your first thought about her when she stepped up there? Oh, she's a sincere person. I mean, that's what I gathered. You know, I'm good at reading people for the most part. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people slide under the radar, but uh, she didn't. And so we kind of exchanged numbers and we texted, you know, here and there every now and then. I mean, you're uh, both. So just to cut you off for a second, you're both very magnetic. So uh, you, you felt that kind of like magnetism from her the same way she felt that magnetism? Well, at the time, I mean, I was actually seeing somebody else and she, you know. Oh. Oh, yeah, now right the there. plot thickens. Yeah. Well, it was one of those things like, man, I really wish this, you know, this could work, but you know, I'm with so and so. But right. uh, but she, you know, she was oh, not dating anybody at the time. But we, so she puts me in the friend zone pretty I early. Did. She, yeah, yeah, the friend zone. And normally there's no escape. It's like the black <laughs> no. hole of yeah, like, like no light will escape. You know. Yeah, Lola yeah. tried that nonsense with me, and I was like, hell no, <laughs> no, no, no. no. So here's what I want, right? Yeah. Uh, but it's one of those deals, you know, for you know, off, you know communicating off and on but not nothing serious ever and uh, so one day just eventually you know said hey I'm gonna be out your way I knew she is out in you know East Tennessee so I'm be coming through your way and uh, she says well would you like to meet up and uh, I said yeah <laughs> I would mm -hmm. and uh, so this kind of just took off from there I think it's like a week later we were right. official so it was pretty pretty early and uh, really yeah mm -hmm. yeah and ever since then you know it, here we are yeah, that's cool. So you guys kind of came together around the time um, that you formed Valor Ridge and all that right kind of before. stuff. Yeah, mm -hmm. right before, and that is, you know, she, it was right before it, and so we had we had a pretty positive interaction with each other. You know, she's somebody that I knew I could trust, and uh, we just had our immediate rapport. You know, we had that kind of thing. Is like, you know, right away, just a, a sincere interaction, and um, it was just like, I, and I kind of told her, you know, what was going on and, and what I was looking to do, and she says, do it, like. It like you're 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 gonna do awesome. I said you really yeah really okay, and uh, 
And, you she know, was right, friends, right? I mean, the, she wasn't wrong. The, the first person I told was my dad, um, who said, absolutely. Like, that is one of the best ideas you had in a while. And I told my other friends, and they said, do it, dude. It's going to it's gonna rock. You're going to go. You're going to hit this guy. Did um, you always did you always want to start a training school? I mean, I think you were a great trainer, you know, working within a school environment. Yeah, yeah. Were you not intending on doing your own thing in the beginning? Or was there always an idea in your mind like, you know, it'd be cool to have my own school? Yeah, I mean, that wasn't ever my intention, man. Like that was that was never my, my intention was was to was to be uh, the best director of training that I could be, you know, and help you know, revise the classes and, and help really take things to a whole nother level. You know, I always took pride, uh, you know, in my role, cause I've always been in a supervisory role, right. I've always been whether it's in the Marines or, uh, you know, in, in school, you know, coaching, things like that. And, you know, when I worked in, uh, out in Camden, I was the director of training and, you know, so I always took pride, you know, in, in, in bringing things up, right. Making, yeah. you know, no, it's it, in the corporate structure. Listen, I, people may not. I mean, we're all alphas in the game, right? There's there's a lot of us that are alphas on different levels. But I think sometimes in a corporate structure, the most powerful thing you can have in a corporate structure is the number two guy. Yeah, is the guy who actually goes out there and does all the uh, you know the dirty work, the right hand, sure. so to speak. So you know, you I think you function well in that role, and that's why I was kind of curious how you you know switched over was it like patriot nurses idea did it just come along <laughs> naturally <laughs> no no it was my idea man it was like almost like uh like a necessary thing after a while you know mm -hmm. you, when you realize that you're only gonna do so many things and you realize that you know you're only gonna uh, be allowed to do so much stuff and then after a while it's like okay i'm not uh, no 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 this is um i gotta i gotta jump to a bigger body of water and um and so it was one of these things where it was kind of like that. It was very scary. I mean, it was, you know, it's very, very uh, scary. And the, the way that I can describe it, like starting your own business and, and actually working for yourself. If anybody's ever seen the movie Indiana Jones in the in the Last yeah. Crusade, it's mm -hmm. like there's the second test that he faces is that there's this big canyon that he's got to go to to get the Holy Grail. Yeah, with no with no visible bridge. Exactly. With no, and he's kind of standing on the precipice. He's like standing, you know, right here, and he has to take that leap of faith. That's what yeah. it felt like. I mean, I didn't, there was no safety net. There's nothing there. All the money I had is the money I had. You know, I, I had X amount of dollars saved up. So I had to buy the property, build the wow. buildings, build the range, uh, develop the curriculum, get a cadre of guys out. And I did that in, um, from, we went from buying the land to build, to getting our first class. It, it, it was literally less than two months. Wow. And so, and, and the Patriot nurse help with the search for this? Cause. Oh yeah. Yeah. I bet you she did. Yeah, she did. She helped with the search. We were looking, and um, we looked at dozens and dozens of places. It was I mean, a lot. It was a crap shoot, you know. It was a, it was a heck of a thing. And so we finally found the property, and I, and I kind of like had this picture when I saw the land, and I kind of envisioned where everything was going to be before we even talked to the owners. Mm -hmm. I had this vision, like I and I saw it, and I and I looked at it, and I said, okay, this is what this is it. I even told us this is the place. Yep. This is the place. And so it, it kind of happened that way. It was on a Was it named it was named Valor Ridge or because because I mean that's the name of that place, right? Or wrong? No, no, that is the name of the company we came up with. Oh, and, uh, okay. So that yeah, place that yeah. area was not called because it's on the maps as Valor Ridge, isn't it? Now, now it now is. It is. <laughs> now it is. <laughs> wow, it is. you guys really pioneered that thing like yeah, oh, it, oh, originally originally it was 1160 Oak Grove Road. <laughs> and, uh, in, <laughs> really? and so now it's, it's the ridge, but you know, it was kind of awesome. like something that was awesome, man. And it was just a heck of a journey. I, I mean, when we and we did it, I mean, I'm, I've spent hundreds of hours just thinking about the curriculum and the classes because there's a lot of things that, that I think people need to learn how to do. And um, and, and it just there's so many, so many things that I wanted people to learn how to do in a pistol and, and rifle class. And, you know, after a while, like there wasn't enough time, you know, to to uh, to just condense it down into two days so that's when our other class came like our mid-range drive austere pistol like those are the other things i wanted people to learn that don't that you know maybe have more time but um you know it's kind of a, a pretty cool you know way it happened but none of this stuff man like i have no i had no experience being a business owner i had no experience you know on on the computer stuff i had no experience doing you know making my own videos and things i, I mean i'd done videos before but uh you know it's just it, it's just an odd thing and it was, it's been a pretty good learning curve. I mean, you find out, uh, I'll tell you something, uh, Hank, man, like you find out who your real buddies are, you know, um, there's a lot of people that, that say that they're your buddy, but when the chips come down on the table, they're not really your buddy. Sure. Uh, they just want something from you. Right. Yeah. And, um, and so that's okay. 
Uh, but I'm, there's no bitterness here. I'm thankful. Like I'm thankful uh, because I'll tell you, like what I, a lot of people don't realize is about my faith, man, is that, you know, I trust God is going to sift uh, the wheat from the chaff out of our life. Uh, you know, we've had some wonderful people come into our life. We've had uh, a lot of good things happen. And, and quite honestly, we've had a big hedge of protection uh, mm -hmm. for us and, and for our business as well, because there's people that start businesses all the time that start firearm schools. Nobody goes. Nobody cares. Um, yeah. But I think us, that's what some folks don't know when they want you, you know, to get on the subject of the controversy. Um, you know, and I get that. I, I totally understand that. I think what people don't realize is that there's really lots of good people out there that stood behind you. Oh, yeah. And helped you out. And you, you've got to give kudos to those guys, because I think that's why a lot of times people don't stand behind other people, because they're afraid of all the negative that comes out of things, because that's what we see. And we never put all the, the positive, beautiful things that happen in that fire that you have to go through that kind of makes your metal. Oh yeah, man. It, it's it's a wonderful thing. You know, it, it's a wonderful thing. I, I've always, uh, you know, I've always subscribed to the idea that you do the right thing, you know, at the right time for the right reasons. And you know, one of the beautiful things about life is free association with people, right? Mm -hmm. I and mean, that's what a free society is: is free association. It's not this um, mutually exclusive. If you do this, then you know you're not allowed to do this. And that's that's like they're not children that need to be punished. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, like I could care less about uh, who's talking with who. Like you just, we're all grown ups. We're all free men. Um, like act like it. Yeah. <laughs> if you're truly well, we are. We are technically. I mean, as you said earlier, you know, and the founding fathers said this that we are born with that inalienable right mm -hmm. to be free. The problem is, is we enslave ourselves mentally. We let other people do it to us. You know, maybe when we we're children growing up our parents and things like that do things that enslave us. But as you get older and you become responsible for yourself as a man, you're also responsible to look at yourself honestly in that mirror and grow up and be a man and be yeah. responsible for your life and your future and the choices you make. Oh yeah, it, it, it's a big thing. Responsibility, I mean, that, that's that's one of the biggest things lacking in society today is responsibility for, uh, for one's actions. You know, I, I just, I'm a huge, huge proponent of of being responsible for your own livelihood, being responsible for your own management of your own affairs, you know, being responsible for, for your positive deeds, but also being responsible for things that you do wrong. You know, that that's one of those things where, where you know, a lot of people will, uh, will try to skimp on things. And it's like, and all, all you've got is your integrity, man. You know, you've yeah. got your integrity, you got your honor, you know, you've got your reputation. And it's really hard to regain uh, those things once you lose them. And so the, the solution or the best course of action is never lose them, right. you know, maintain them, keep yeah. them, keep them, keep them close to your chest, you know, keep them close to you, even though if it's heavy and you got to trudge on a long, you know, hike or something, don't just throw them out and always keep them with you because that's really all you've got in life. And, um, you know, our philosophy that my philosophy that I've always lived by is, um, worry or excuse me, the philosophy I've lived by is, take care of the people that trust you to take care of them, right? Mm -hmm. uh, take care of people that are, that are, they're coming to you for a reason. Like they sign up for class, they come to the class for a reason. They come there and they want, they, they trust that what they're going to get is going to help them save their life or protect their loved ones one day. They come to the class trusting that they're going to get treated. Uh, they're going to have their questions answered. You know, they're going to get the material that they want to learn. And, and that's why, and I teach every class. I'm at every single class. Like if, if you sign up for a class with us, like, I'm going to be there, right? Um, because what else would I be doing? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, yeah. What, going on I mean you, do have, you do have some guys that come in and, and do things with you every now and then, right? But it's pretty much you. Yeah. I mean, I've got my other guys, you know, that, mm -hmm. that, that are other instructors as well. And they're great. Um, you know, we've had some really cool guys that have, that have put in a lot of work, you know, behind the scenes, guys like Ben and JJ and, uh, you know, Clay's been there a lot too. And, uh, we've had some really, really good people that have that have done great things, and uh, JJ and I just got done this uh, this past weekend or Sunday, Monday, and second and third of July. We just did our pistol class, it went great. But uh, yeah, we have other guys. We've we've got some really good people, and and I couldn't be more more thankful for uh, for the students, man. I mean, they're they're the they're the bread and butter of everything. I think like uh, it's easy to get frustrated sometimes. It's easy to you know to um, I mean, you get the same question every single week, over and over and over again. But I gotta remember, like, I gotta remember that I, I didn't answer them; I answered somebody else. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Maybe that's why you, uh, you know, you could help with some of that. Sometimes you can control the narrative, sure. but I, you know, I, I get that. You know what I think here, here's something. Um, it's weird that I found there's people who say they believe in freedom right. and that's the whole thing about America. That's what this podcast is about. That's what the 4th of July is about. That's what you're about if you're a gun guy, if you're a Second Amendment guy. You say you believe in freedom. And those people who believe in freedom, within that group of people, there's people that want to create little kingdoms. And they want to take away other people's freedom. They want to control other people. And I think that's sometimes how you get into a lot of these situations. And I think people should always look out for that. Because if you're really a patriot, if you really believe in freedom, it's not to say you won't work with people or work for people or take instruction from people or follow. Sometimes you have to be, in order to be a leader, you have to follow people. But you know there's a thing inside of your heart, inside of your soul that speaks to you and gives you all the warning signs. And sometimes the angels come along and sometimes it's a, it's a good angel that comes along to save you, like Patriot Nurse. Yeah. You know, and and you've and you've got to learn how to pay attention to those things and follow them. Yeah, it's a uh, it's amazing, man. The older that that I get, I mean, the more I look into life and how it works, and the less I see coincidences. You know, it's it's almost like, uh, yeah, we do have choices in that, but um, it just it's amazing how when you uh, when you when you realize that uh, it's it's just an amazing it's an amazing life if you keep courage and you don't weaken. You know, like that. You know, that's the thing. You, if you have a good life and you don't weaken, that that that's the reward. I mean, at the end of my life, hopefully it'll be at 120. <laughs> but at the end of at the end of my life, I, I want to look back and I want to say, you know, times were hard. There were difficult things. There were there were certain rough. Uh, everybody faces trials. I mean, everybody yes. faces ups and downs. But I want to be able to look back and say, you know what? I handled each situation with the best of my ability, and, and at the end of the day, I didn't worry about things so much. And now, you know, it's been a great year. I mean, I'm, there's really not a whole lot to worry about because we've got people. I mean, there's so many great people that have come, and then they're bringing their family back, and, and they're bringing their friends back. And it's like in any class, we've got 25, 30% of the class that's already been there. Yeah. Well, if something's good, you know it. So if something's good, you know. It. Okay, let me get into questions because I'm sure. All right. So here's um, I'm going to hit I'm going to start hitting some questions. So someone wants to know. I'm not sure who this is. They want to know, are your classes more offensive or truly defensive training? How do you? Well, I'm sure guns will offend somebody no matter what you do. <laughs> yeah. But no one that's coming to your classes. I'll tell you that. <laughs> oh, no. We, we try to um, as far as offensive or defensive. I mean, I'm, I'm not like teaching people how to ambush anybody and like set up, you know, hey, you lay down at the, at the, you know, just just try to persuade the jury that they made a move, even if no, none of that stuff. Would it's like people use the terms offensive, defensive, and that's fine. Mm -hmm. But understand that like the majority of the time, criminals are the ones that inaugurate the violence, mm -hmm. right? I mean, the best way to do that is just to observe your surroundings and and to try to see it before it comes. If you can't. If it's kind of like all of a sudden, which a lot of times it is, um, yeah, then you got to go into action. I mean, the best way to you know to do that is to be armed. I mean, that, yeah. that's the best way. If you're armed, you've got more choices than not. But offensive yeah. or defensive, I would just say that it's uh, that they're classes that that will allow you to fight. I mean, that that's what they'll allow you to do. But you got to have your gun on you to do it. Yeah. Um, and they're neither offensive nor defensive. They are, in fact, a state of being that already exists. It's like is a small is a smoke alarm a warning thing or is it uh, is it something that causes a fire? Of course. Yeah, not. Or it's like if you're learning martial arts, are you learning martial arts because you want to kick someone's ass, or are you right. learning martial arts because you want to you know be better able to defend yourself, or you want to uh, introduce some kind of discipline in your life, or a combination yeah. of those things? But the but the you know most of the guys I know out there who are martial artists are not doing it because they want to hurt other people, and they don't exactly. go out there pushing people around. Right. Um, I think it's the same thing with guns. You know, most of us don't want, like, we obviously want the right to have guns. And I know that's, we can get into that conversation about like open carry and everything. Most of us though, don't want people to know that we're armed and we try to avoid getting into situations. But the minute that something happens that that gun has to come out, everything is offensive at that point. 
Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and, and I don't I don't want to limit it to just defensive, you know, pistols or whatever it's what some people call it. But because I mean, the, the truth of the matter is, if somebody tries to rob me, I will be on the defense, right? Mm-hmm. For anybody else, if somebody, uh, you know, somebody tries to carjack me, I will be on the defensive. Not right. for long because we're going to push that fight. But say we're out in society, you know, we're out in a movie theater, we're out in a you know, picking somebody up from school or, you know, we're out in a, uh, a mall somewhere and then there's an active shooter. Well, I'm not going to be defensive about that. I'm going to go straight. I'm going to push the fight to the bad guy if I have the option to do that. So in that case, it's not defensive at all. In that case, it's we're going to hunt a bad guy that's hurting other people. So yeah. I, would, I wouldn't call my classes uh, defensive or offensive. I would just call them simply protective. Yeah, I think it depends on what someone's talking about when they're saying that. And I don't think that this person is saying Right. This the the person who asked this question, but it, you know there are look there are some people who do train and do all these things for the wrong reasons, and maybe they're thinking, hey, if the apocalypse or the shit hits the fan or whatever, I'm gonna go out there, I'm gonna be able to to take this from someone and do this to people or whatever, and you can put that in the category of being offensive. For the most part, we're we're just trying, we just want to be able to survive and still be free, no matter what government or society we're living in. Oh yeah, I mean, I, I don't like marauders, man. Like, you know, I don't like people that would that would steal from others in a time of need. I think, uh, you know, one of the things that that separates us from animals truly is is our ability to reason and to uh, implement that golden rule. Just like you wouldn't want somebody coming and stealing your food supply, why would you do that to somebody else? Uh, you know, in fact, you know, if, if that's if that's what other people want to do, then they're they're going to find that. But they're going to be alone pretty quick because uh, most people, you know, wouldn't subscribe to that. And if they do, then, um, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, but. Yeah, I understand. I mean, it depends on, you know, what system, what system of discipline you have for yourself or religion or what, you know, however, however you want to put it. What do you believe in? I personally believe in do unto others, yeah. you know, until they try to do some stuff onto you. <laughs> and then you have to deal with that. Right. Yeah. It's, that's it, man. I mean, you know, if you just do the right thing, the right thing is is uh, is not stealing. <laughs> you know, the right thing is not lying. The right thing is not killing or murdering. Yeah, uh, it, it's all written down. Yeah, help your fellow man. I mean, even sometimes in a bad situation, I don't think people realize this. Things look like they can go bad, and a lot of it has to do with talking. Now, I'm not saying, look, you know, if you if you just backed into a corner, obviously, and you have to save yourself. You know that that is what it is. But a lot of times you can diffuse things and help your fellow man and and turn them around if you if you're just willing to see things that way. Yeah, man. Um, it's all it's all about <laughs> it's all about preparation ahead of time. You know, it's yeah. all about knowing knowing what's going on. And it's a yeah. big believer. I'm a big believer in in trying to diffuse things before it gets kinetic. Mm-hmm. But uh, but if it goes kinetic, then all in. Yeah, it just kicks in. Do you have an age limit? I think someone was asking a question on, on, be, on the behind the scenes chat. Do you have an age limit for people to take the classes? Um, or how young? How young can people start taking the classes? Well, that's a. Uh, I mean, I've had students as young as thirteen. Um, that would be up to the you know the guardian, of course, because I, I don't know your kid better than you do. You know your kid whether they're responsible or not. Uh, thing is, though, is if they're under the legal age, which of course is eighteen. Um, then the the guardian is going to have to accompany them to class. That's that's, that's and yeah, yeah, they're going to be a student as well. So that's the only caveat to that. And as far as like uh, older, like being you know at the the seasoned age, there's no seasoned age limit. I mean, older people, you know, senior citizens are some of the most vulnerable people in society. So you know, mm-hmm. they definitely need to learn. And what's cool is that we've had people, you know, that have been well beyond uh, retirement age that have come and trained with us and. Uh, you know, they, they've done very well. Have you seen, have you had someone come in that was maybe too young? Um, like maybe someone was trying to bring someone to the class that was 10 years old or, or eight years old maybe. And, um, no, no, we, we haven't had any of that. We, we've, uh, we've actually had some pretty, pretty squared away young men and women that have come mm-hmm. and, and trained with us. They're motivated, they're hungry, mm-hmm. you know, they got out there and made it happen. You know, people in high school, um, you know, freshmen, you know, high school, eighth graders, and they've done very well. They came with their parents. Of course, parents took the class with them. Yeah. And, uh, and they've done very well. I think that there was, um, I think there was a 16 year old uh, girl at the class that I was at. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I think she was like six, she was, she was, um, in the a teenage 
Yeah, yeah, I remember that class. We've yeah. had a lot of those. We've had a lot of high school students, and um, you know they do great. I mean, they're they're the ones that follow directions. You know, they're they're smart. Um, mm -hmm. They're they're good. They're good to go. Yeah, I think if you've got if you've got someone that's really young, but you think they they have um, the skills, you have to remember you're still taking these kids to a class with other people. Maybe other people don't feel comfortable, but you know. So let's say below that age of thirteen. It really comes down to what kind of skill level do they have, and do you feel comfortable with them being, you know, in in a class situation like this versus with other kids? Because I've taken my kids to firearms training that was, uh, you know, based on their age group. Sure. Yeah, man. It's it's just um, as long as you follow firearms handling rules, there's not an issue. But when you when you can't do that, then 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 nobody can train, regardless of how old or how young they are. Right, absolutely. Okay, so here's another. Let's jump to another question. Someone wants to know if you believe in unity, and can we renew the people's pride in the idea of a republic? I think we, uh, I think we can renew people's pride in a republic. But first, they got to be taught what that is. You know, people okay. um, use terms all the time, and they don't know what the terms are. They, uh, it's a word, and words have lost meaning over time. Uh, a republic, you know, is is in the concept of federalism. You know, federalism isn't where the federal government reigns supreme over state governments. That's that's not what federalism is. Federalism is dual sovereignty between state governments and a fe uh, federal government between the states, right? Um, unity? Uh, that's a tough one, man. Um, you know, unity is – man, I, I don't know – really, to, to answer that question, I don't, I don't know how, that, how you would measure that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how can you have unity uh, – with a group of people that doesn't believe in private property? Yeah, I mean, people are so diametrically opposed nowadays and we're falling into camps. I mean, obviously there's gray area, but I think pretty much in America, we've got like these two separate, these two big, huge separate camps. And we could put, we could put Republicans even, I'm not just talking about Democrats or liberals, no, you can put no, Republicans in the camp of people who don't really believe in liberty and freedom because they're taking, the, they're taking it away from us. Yeah, it's, it's a problem. Um, you know, I mean, you got on one, you know, on the extreme. I mean, you talk about people you know, that are extreme. I mean, there's people that think that individuals should be taxed at 60 and 70 percent. Mm -hmm. and, and, and at what point do you at what point do you stop being a citizen and literally start being a slave? Oh, uh, yeah. You, uh, it's, it's a little bit before that. But, yeah, I mean, at that point, you are approaching full slavery. Yeah. I mean, you can't you can't have a free society that that depends on the uh strong arm robbery of people that produce wealth you know i mean it's it's, it's wrong um you know when I mean, you got people that say no you can't have guns and you got other people in the camp the in in certain camps that say no you know not only should you not have guns you know you shouldn't even uh you shouldn't even be allowed to keep any you know you you're, you should you shouldn't even be allowed to drive certain cars you shouldn't be able to burn wood uh, you shouldn't be able to i mean there's people that are just insane so i don't know Unity, you'd have to find a unifying principle, and if that unifying principle isn't freedom, then we're just treading water and not really going to shore or back to the boat. Yeah, unfortunately, I think it, there's a lot of people out there that are not willing to live and let live. Exactly. Um, now, obviously, um, you know, we could say, okay, well, just let people live and let live and do whatever they want. No, I'm not talking about do whatever you want or take property from someone else or take their life. I'm saying, you know, I think we can all live the lives that we want to live. Just kind of like stay out of our business. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Freedom, man. It, it freedom. Freedom's this thing that, uh, you know, we just can't do whatever we want when we want to. That, that, that doesn't work very long. Um, freedom comes with responsibilities, you know. Uh, it, it does. I mean, people use that phrase, and I hate using cliches, but I can't. Yeah. I can't think of any anything else other than yeah. Freedom is good. We we have the right to life to protect our own lives. We have the right to to, to liberty, which means that that we can do what we want and we're not hurting somebody else. And 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 pursuit of happiness, which means acquiring and improving property. You know, property isn't just land. You know, property is is your wages that you earn and um, and everything like that. So. And we gotta have if we're gonna have unity, man, you're gonna have to have a unifying principle. I mean, we are called the United States of America, but united for what? I, I don't think that that uh, that the founding fathers or anybody that started this country had the idea that you couldn't even carry a firearm outside of your front door. 
I mean, your Second Amendment rights don't stop at your front door any more than your First Amendment rights stop at your front door. I mean, yeah. what, when you leave your house, all of a sudden you're not allowed to say what you feel anymore? Well, you know I think I mean? what I, I think what's happening is that there, there's obviously problems in the world, right? And that and the world has changed as it should change from what it was hundreds of years ago to what it is today. And there's problems in the world. And then there's people who are taking those problems and saying to us, well, because we have these problems, we're going to need to take away a little bit of, you know, a little bit of freedom here, a little bit of this from you, a little bit of that, take your money from you. And then we'll solve these problems and the world will be a happy utopia. Um, and I, and, and honestly, yes, I, I think I, you know, I would accept that the world has changed from what it was a long time ago, but as human beings, we haven't, the, the core of what we are hasn't changed that much. And there's bad human beings and there's good human beings. There's people who want to, you know, live like vultures or parasites off, off of other people. And there are people who don't, I mean, I think a lot of it is still the same and that's why those, that's why those things should still apply. But there's people out there telling us, no, we should change everything because, it was different then. Today, you don't need all these guns. You don't need this. You don't need that. I don't believe that. I believe that we still do, and, and we we always will. Yeah, I mean the, the same people that will say, "Well, yes, the world has changed." Well, when has the world not changed? I mean, mm -hmm. when has the world not changed? Every day is different than the day it came before. But if there's one thing that the that the founders did understand is that, yeah, the world may change, but human beings do not change. No, they do not change. They never have. They're not going to change. You know, it is it is a fixed thing. There, there are going to be tendencies. And as long as there are positions of power, there will be ambitious individuals seeking to, to go into those seats of power. And because there will be seats of power, we can't change the rules constantly uh, to give them more power. I mean, it's it's like the founders knew that, yeah, there may be virtuous people that occupied the presidency in the beginning. George Washington definitely had the country's best interests at heart. But it wasn't always going to be George Washington that was the president. Sometimes you're going to get someone like a Woodrow Wilson or an FDR or mm -hmm. an LBJ, mm -hmm. you know, or, or somebody, anybody else, take, you know, your pick. But they knew that because there was going to be ambitious individuals in there and that there were going to be people that didn't necessarily have the country's best heart, interests at heart, you have to have hard and fast limits on that office. Mm -hmm. You have to. And, and it's like you, the more that people try to make the world a fair place, the more unfair it becomes because the world isn't fair. Life isn't fair. Yeah, we're all guaranteed equal protection under the law, but all, all human beings are created equal. Well, they're, they're created equal. They're, they are created equally under the law, but they're not created with equal outcomes. Yeah, I'm not going to beat Usain Bolt in the 100-yard dash. It's not going to happen. Right. Also, uh, I was having this discussion with my son uh, when we were talking about like, you know, obviously being in college, even in high school, there are kids that are taking drugs and stuff like that. And, um, you know, we were, we were talking about why and, and people just want to constantly be happy. And, and I was telling him, we're not designed as human beings to live in this constant state of euphoria. And people who are pursuing that, they don't realize what they're doing to destroy themselves because we were not meant to constantly be happy. We have to go up and down in emotions. No, there's pride in hard work, right? I mean, an individual's got to be um, pride that you've got to take pride in your work. You got to be able to work hard. You've got to be able to overcome obstacles. You have to suffer. You have to suffer. There, there's going to be times where you're not happy in life. There, you've got to have times where you're not happy in life. It's just like every night. There's morning, you know, and when it's when it's winter, there's gonna be a summer. Mm -hmm. um, there's there's going to be separation. There's going to be uh, evil individuals. There's going to be good individuals. But you know, it, it, it's like uh, I'll, I'll tell you, man. I, I just really want uh, to emphasize that limits on government are absolutely necessary because government is, as George Washington says, like fire, a dangerous servant and a fearful master. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Someone wants to. Uh, there's a question here. Someone wants to know what you think about minimum wage. Do you have a, I, I guess that's maybe a little bit relative to what we're saying. I know folks out there want to raise the minimum wage and there's all kinds of minimum different things wage. related to that. Yeah. Minimum wage is the concept that a third party can mandate a voluntary interaction between a separate two party entity. I mean, what, a, you know, that hurts, you know, if you think about it, uh, minimum wage, what if a, what if a teenager is willing to work for less? Mm -hmm. What if he's willing to work for less?
Mm -hmm. you destroyed that opportunity. And not only that, but you may have cost him or her a job because may, and, and did anyone ever think of this possibility? Maybe that individual's not worth a certain minimum wage. And I don't say that flippantly and I, cause I've worked, I've worked for way less than minimum wage. Trust me. Okay. Absolutely. I've worked for way less. Um, it, but, uh, I don't, I don't believe that, uh, that there should be a regulator between, uh, two voluntary parties. But I mean, that's one of the strongest relationships that a free market has is the ability for one party to negotiate with the other without interference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that we're, we're creating lots of problems. People do look when you're starting a company, like you're saying that you did or that I'm doing, you don't, I don't even draw a wage. <laughs> so it's <Right>. zero. <laughs> You know, yeah. I mean, and there's lots of things in life that we do. Do you draw a wage for being a parent? Right. You know, right. Um, when you have things like minimum wage and, and all these kinds of things going into it, what about people doing apprenticeships or internships? Sure. Uh, you're, you're denying sometimes people the ability to gain skills or, or knowledge or experience of a craft and things like that. So. Um, and then, and obviously we see in places, for example, like San Francisco, where they push it up to high levels that then it makes it almost impossible to live there. Yeah. In those places. It, yeah. There, I mean, the phrase unintended consequences comes to mind because, you know, it's, uh, you know, there's some economists, I'm sure that would argue that hurricanes are positive for the local economy because it puts the window maker in business and it <laughs> provides the landscaper with more. And, but who's to say that those resources wouldn't be used for something better. Mm -hmm. um, if hurricanes are so awesome to the economy, let's all just go out and tear the country down and you know, uh, give jobs to everybody that wants to. Of course it doesn't work that way. So um, oftentimes when you, there, if, I, I'm a big believer that there are no solutions in life. There's only trade-offs. I mean, we have finite resources. You're not gonna solve anything. Um, it's a, there are trade-offs. When you, when you trade capital and time for one thing, something else is sacrificed. Mm -hmm. So there's this trade off, you know, and, and it's like uh, minimum wage is not a solution. They wanted it to be a solution, but it's a trade off. You are trading off people that are able and willing to work for less for people now that get more than they may be worth. Yeah. Um, furthermore, if, you know, understand the concept of inflation, uh, you know, I mean, in cash flow and uh, it just doesn't really work. I mean, what if we yeah. made if minimum if a minimum wage is so positive to the economy, why don't we just make minimum wage a hundred bucks an hour? Yeah, we could just keep making all kinds of, of crazy yeah, I mean, numbers. We could have a nation of millionaires in no time, but it wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be a millionaire in the sense that we know now. It'd be a millionaire like Zimbabwe. Yeah, exactly. I was Iowa thinking. Of, bread. Yeah, I was thinking of some African nations. I mean, we could we'll just be printing money. You know, I I um I lived through that in a very wealthy African country in the eighties in Nigeria, and and when we went to live in Nigeria, we would come to America to visit. And at this time in the early 80s, because Nigeria provides America 25% of its oil, it still does. Oh, yeah. And um, their Naira, which is their currency, their Naira was worth two bucks in the 80s. So as a kid, if I did chores or whatever, my folks gave me money. If I had 100 Naira when I came to America, it was 200 bucks. Right. You know, today, their currency, it takes like three, four hundred Naira to make one American dollar because yeah. they, they have all this oil money. And, and you know, they, they had this wealth, but they just kept printing money to, to solve issues. Right. So and I, and I, I understand people that, that are concerned about the minimum, which I'm not trying to dismiss anybody at all. It's just you have to understand the laws of economics. You have to know how this stuff works. And I'm not saying they don't. But uh, when you when you start when you start mandating price floors or price ceilings or minimum wage, that the the cost always goes up. Yeah, and if you're if you if someone's an employer and they have someone working for them and they don't properly compensate them, you know, like right now it's it's a little bit different because we have these weird systems in place here in America. But I think if you if you're an employee employer and you have an employee, you don't properly compensate them. And they're and what they do is valuable. They can go somewhere else, and you lose that. And then you go, wait a second, I don't want to lose that. But in, in today's world, we have a lot of things that get in the way of that. Yeah, and make it difficult for people to do those kinds of things because not only do they have minimum wages, they have all kinds of limitations on who they can hire. You know, you used to be able to hire people in a completely different way in America, uh, as opposed to the way that we do it now, which is based oh, yeah. on you know, race and sex and this thing and that thing. Um, and so all those things that we're trying to do to, to change everything, I think it goes back to what you're saying. You know, there's, like you said, there's really, 
you know, people think that there's solutions that you can fix this thing. Well, every solution creates a new problem or everything that you want, you have to be willing to give up everything that you have. Right. I, it's absolutely true. And it's just, uh, it's bothersome because in a, in a land where, you know, the best and the brightest are supposed to be the ones getting hired. Oftentimes they're the ones prevented from being hired because of spurious legislation, you know, and, mm -hmm. uh, and that's a sad thing because who gets hurt by that? Everybody else. Yeah. I mean, and if you look at it, it's like people and, and lots of people out there would know this. If you've ever worked for a regular company and not for yourself, that you get paid, you know, when you get paid uh, and people take probably take this, uh, don't even think about this now. But when you get paid, these taxes come out of your check. Well, it wasn't always like that. <laughs> right. Right. You know, because we because this because we decided that the government had to do all these things. You know, the government didn't take the money from you. The government had to try to get it from you after you got it and spent it. Right. And then they said, mm, yeah, that doesn't work. <laughs> so then right. they started taking this money from us. Yeah. Right. So unless you're self-employed and you have your own business, when you go to work, when Lola goes to work and works for a company or anyone out there that works for a company, you get your check. The government takes a whole big chunk out of it. And you're like, where, where the hell is that going? Oh yeah, man, it's crazy. I mean, the, the way they pushed it through originally was pretty nefarious. I mean, they they sold it as a tax on only the wealthiest, you know, uh, top one percent. And then yeah. once they got the foot in the door, they just kept opening it. And now it's like yeah. people making thirty, thirty-five grand a year. It's everyone. Can, if you work, if yeah. you work at McDonald's, if you work anywhere, if someone cuts you a check, unless you're getting paid in cash or something like that, you know, off the books, they have to take out that money for the government. Right. It's it's harmful. I mean, there, there's no question. I wish, uh, you know, we could go back to a time when when people valued uh, that kind of thing because it's um, you know, it's, it's very harmful. You know, knowing you work so hard. I know you do too. And you know, at the end of the year, you gotta you gotta write the Internal Revenue Service X amount of dollars. I want to know what service they provide besides besides. Yeah, I'll tell you what property. they provide. I mean, they're like out there buying up a lot of um, tanks and <laughs> no, you know whatever they're gonna do. Yeah, yeah, they're doing they're doing a bunch of crazy stuff with it in terms of like you know. I mean, it, it's it sounds like conspiracy theories to people, but they're using that to create all these government agencies that make sure they keep getting their money and they keep us under control. And yeah. maybe if they didn't have access to all this money, we wouldn't would have like all these government agencies. I, I would like that very much because I. You know, I don't have any problem helping my fellow American when they're down on their luck. I don't have a problem, you know, reaching into my own wallet and helping somebody out. You know, we live in a great country where, you know, we can help a man when he's down. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, when somebody else reaches into that wallet, that's when it becomes pretty problematic. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let me hit up another question. Someone says, uh, some see Thomas Jefferson as a hero. Others see him as a horrible person who owns slaves. What are your thoughts on Thomas Jefferson as a historian that you are? I, I don't think he was a horrible person at all. I mean, you know, um, you know, it's always the slavery topic that comes up with when it comes. And basically what people do when they say that is they make simplistic judgments on complex societies, centuries removed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, slavery, you know, for <laughs> in the world has been a very common yeah, I mean, maybe maybe we have to have the slavery conversation first of all, right? That's fine. I mean, you know, because I think that um, this is what people don't understand about slavery. I think a lot of people in America today, around the world, they think slavery is just like this unique thing to maybe black people. Not um, at all. <laughs> Not at all. Yeah, and so we have to have that conversation. It's obviously something that happened very recently on a grand scale to people of African descent. Um, but it's something that's happened to everyone at different points of history and that everyone today is also, I think there's people that are slaves of every single race, read, uh, I'm sorry, not read, creed, religion, etc. that are slaves right now today, but it's happened to everyone as well. Yeah, um, it, it's, it's one of these things, and Jefferson, you know, did you know that um, Thomas Jefferson actually wanted to free his slaves? He tried to. But the state legend, the state law of Virginia would not allow him to do that. Okay. And and when people, um, when people actually think, oh, he owns slaves, he, he's this horrible person. Um, I'm not for slavery. You know, that's not my thing. You know, even even if it was legal, I wouldn't own one. You know, or two, yeah. or any number at all. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wouldn't do that. I, I believe, but and the reason why I wouldn't do it, and I wouldn't care what race somebody is if they're a slave it doesn't really matter to me what race they are but um if 
the, the evil part of slavery isn't the work mm -hmm. that people are forced to do. That, that's not the evil part of it. The evil part of it is depriving the individual of the fruits of their labor. See, that's the evil part of slave. The work isn't evil. Mm -hmm. What's evil is not is depriving the slave of the fruits of their labor. That's what's evil. And and if we look at it from that aspect, we look at it from uh, the the aspect of that that it is them working and somebody else taking their capital or their produce or their raw materials that they carved with their own bare hands and muscles. That's the evil part about it. If we look at it that way. Um, you can't really make a case for coercive taxes, right? Well, yeah, I mean, because that's slavery. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's a form yeah. of it. So, but I mean, you look at slavery in the United States. Um, it, it's really not that unique. I, I mean, it, if you look at the way the Romans treated slaves, is pretty brutal. Um, look at the way the Egyptians treated my ancestors. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I, I mean, we're not sitting here whining about it. We remember the redemption. You know, we remember that we were brought out of slavery from Egypt, right? Yeah, and I so, think I think as a as a I don't want to say this as a practical thing, but I think in at a certain time in history, based on technology, the easiest thing to do was enslave another human being sure. into, um, uh, you know, doing these uh, manual labors or tasks or, or, or building things. So in other words, you just take people and however you want to put it under whatever guise you want to put it, you force people to do things. I mean, the, everyone had this, even though the British seemed to be anti-slavery, they had slavery in their times, there was, you know, um, they they owned the people who lived on their land. Those people worked for them and all that kind of, this always existed. And then basically it was just based on, there wasn't the technology that we have today with uh, farming machines and this thing and that thing. We just didn't have it, right? Right. So wherever you go in history, wherever you go in, in um, on the planet, there were people who were slaves. Now, I think there's still slavery today. Mm -hmm. Now, sure. there's actual physical slavery. There's people who are sex slaves and people who are actually slaves around the world. And then there's all of us that fall into the category of yeah, of economic slavery. Sure. Right? Sure. Where, and this is what you're talking about with taxation, where someone says, okay, you went out, you worked, or you started a business, you did this thing. We're taking this money from you, and we're going to do whatever we want to with it. So it's a different kind of thing. Like you just... It's it's a it's a kind of slavery where you think you have everything because you got a nice car, you got a house, you got your family. Oh, I could do whatever I want. And the truth of the matter is, you really cannot do whatever you want. Someone's taking a, a big chunk of the money that you make and doing whatever they want with it, and you have no say in it. And a lot of times they're like, "Well, and you also can't have guns, and you can't do this thing, and if you have a gun, if you can have a gun in that state, you can't come to our state and have that." Right. Gun. Right. It's pretty wild. But I mean, as far as um, as far as, as, as the original premise, the original question, Jefferson being an evil man, I don't know how you could call somebody evil that uh, wrote the foundational document of this country. And just I mean, he did so many amazing things in his life. I mean, he did so many amazing things as not only um in Congress, but I mean, he, he was just an amazing man as president of the United States as well. I mean, the guy wiped out the national debt, mm -hmm. zero balance almost. I mean, he cut it, he cut it so dramatically and so substantially. I mean, um, I mean, maybe 200 years from now, someone will call people that drives a car an evil person. Yeah. I think, it, I think it's based on how you, you look at it. I, I, I don't think, first of all, was he a human being or was he some kind of robot or alien right. that fell? Right. So I think he was a human being. And I look at it the way we all look at our parents, right? So our parents are were probably, none of us think our parents are perfect, right? But they did things and they brought us into the world and we somehow survived and we're here. So now our job is to do what? Be better, right? We're supposed to be better. So when you look at the founding fathers, I think all the founding fathers, you can find things that are wrong with them, just like you can find things wrong with, with all the different politicians that exist today. The whole goal is to be to take what they created that allowed us to constantly make this thing better. And that's why America is not the same place that it was back then, but it's, it's better than anywhere else in the world based on the structure that they put in place. Right. 
It is. I mean, and it's, it says in order to form a more perfect union, right? right. Uh, you're never going to be a perfect country. You're never going to have a perfect society. I mean, there's never going to be anything perfect. But what made it endure the way that it has and what's made it uh, be – I mean, people vote with their feet. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's more people wanting to come here than any other place on earth. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and what made what makes it what it is is the concept that you do have rights. You know, the concept that you do – have the opportunities here that you, I mean, do you think that I could start what I've done here? Like, do you think that like this, that do you think that original is impossible in like France or Germany or Britain? Oh, for sure. It'd be impossible. I mean, oh, I'd be, I'd be like a war criminal by the UN or something, you know, yeah, uh, you know or, or they, I'd be like an, uh, uh, you know, who knows what they would label me. Yeah. You're training insurgents. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like some right winger crazy person or something, you know, yeah. I, I must hate everybody, you know, um, and all this stuff. But I mean, the, the point I'm trying to make here is like uh, the, all those guys, I mean, they, you know, you got to judge them by the standards of their times. And, and for, I mean, there's certain people that do evil stuff that would be evil in any time. For example, I think we can all agree um, that um, no matter what time period it is, communism is evil. Like, I mean, mm -hmm. it, it, the Soviet Union, it's not an excuse, you know, to murder, you know, tens of millions of your own people to form a better society. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not acceptable in, you know, communist China, the Mao, during their wars, you know, against their own people. I mean, it's not, there's no, at any time is there a rationale that you can kill tens of millions of your own citizens because they don't buy into your political narrative. Yeah, well, what's happening in North Korea, I mean, we could, right. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's that's all I'm saying about that. And it's like, you know, it's, uh, you got to be very careful judging people based on modern standards or the standards of what we hold important today. Because quite honestly, Hank, there's a lot of people that have standards and values in this country that I think they should be put in a lunatic asylum. Okay. Um, I'm not going to put them there. I'm not going to say that they should be. I'm saying if in a sane world, they would be put in a lunatic asylum, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't, I mean, whatever their standards are, I mean, if, uh, you know, take whatever topic you want to today, um, that's fine. But understand something. No one's going to be reading about them in 200 or 300 years. Yeah. I, look, I think that the uh, the whole the whole thing of slavery and all that kind of stuff, I think specifically to to the African slave or the descendant of those African slaves. I think it's like a touchstone thing for a lot of people. And I get it. I understand it. Um, sure. And I'm not trying to, like, take it away. It definitely influenced the world. It influenced where I came from. I wasn't born in America. I was born in the Caribbean. But, you know, I'm descendant of slaves as well. Um, and, you know, sometimes I'm, I'm not saying it's a good thing because I think in lots of places that you had slavery, when you talk about, you know, uh, Jewish, the slavery that Jewish people endured and all that kind of stuff, you know, you go through that and it can make you stronger if you survive it. Yep. And I think that, unfortunately, there's not enough uh, of those of us here in America that are descendant of slaves that look at it and realize, like, if you look at Africa today, how many places in Africa would you really want to go live in forever versus living here in America? Uh, not too many. I mean, I've never been there, but from what I understand, it's not the world's biggest, best playground. Yeah, so, and I'm not um, saying Africa is like a horrible, horrible place, but, you know, um, it's, it's tough to have that conversation, right? And a lot of people don't understand. Like, I get it. I'm actually married to an African. And the, and the way that Africans look at those, those of us in the Caribbean and those of us in America that are descendant of slaves is that we're the garbage they threw away. For the most part, they sold their own people into slavery. And they, and they still see us today in a modern world as garbage compared to them. But, it, but is that really true? Because there's lots of people in Africa, lots of people around the world, not just Africa, that want to come to America because of the freedoms that we have. Sure. And, and because of all the, the trials and, and, and uh, the horrible things that, the, that slaves and descendants of those slaves went through here in America, and that America went through, this is a better place. It's not perfect. But it's a better place because there's a system in place to make it better versus when you look at other like the real old. What are the oldest civilizations that we still have right now? Uh, is it uh, is it Greece? Is Greece the oldest one? It's old. It's one. Of, it's older one. I mean, you look at I mean, if, if you look at societies as far or con, you know, as far as countries, I mean, there are old, old places out there, but they're not. It's not a model. It's not a stagnant thing. You know, there's always going to be. I mean, China's old. Yeah, uh, that's true. Of, yeah, Middle East, Iraq. You know, uh, and what are they? And, and my thing about that is, what are these places doing? What are they doing to advance the world? Are they? Are they? Are they feeding the world? Or are they feeding off of the world? Are they pushing the world forward? 
or are they pulling the world down? Right. It, it's 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 got to be one of these deals, man, where where you look at things objectively and say, um, the most influential country of the 20th century, without a doubt, without any without any thought whatsoever, extra thought, the most influential country of the last hundred years has been the United States of America. I yeah. mean, we have touched uh, all parts of the world, um, mostly for the good. You know, yeah, I mean, I say it because here's why. Here's why I say it in here. Like, this is probably me getting on my soapbox a little bit, but I say it because, like, uh, my brother was talking to me about a friend of ours that we that we've known for a long time since we were like probably I don't know in our early in our early formative years, and he, he he's a black guy and uh, lives in New York City. Never graduated high school. Nothing wrong with that. Got a GED. He makes a hundred thousand dollars a year. Okay, good, good living. $100,000 a year and is constantly saying that he has to leave America because it's so horrible here right. that he makes $100,000 a year. Right. You know, and this is the thing, like, I, I really, I mean, if you think there's some place in the world that you can go to and do that, I, I invite anyone who believes that America, I'm not, I don't think America is perfect. You know, but man, there's nowhere else like this on the planet. And if you think there is, I really do truly invite you to leave and go there. Yeah, and and it's and it's like um, I fully agree with that. But you know, we got to keep it that way, and it's uh, it's an important thing. I, I'd really like to see. I'd really like to see a repeal of a lot of laws. I'd like to see a repeal mm -hmm. of and limit the the size and the scope um, mm -hmm. of many uh, entities of the federal government and state governments, for that matter. And uh, I'd like to see a lot of, of uh, I would like to see a receding of, of a government power. I would like to see right. that in my lifetime. I'd, I'd love to see constitutional carry in all 50 states. I'd love to see, you know, lower taxes. I'd love to see, uh, you know, school districts take control of their schools again, as opposed to having a federal department of education. I'd love to see, uh, I'd love to see as small units of government as possible. I'd love to see all that. And I think if we did that, I think the quality of life would improve for everybody. I think that there'd be a lot more happiness and that there would be less gripes and that there would be a lot more responsibility at the personal level. And I think that's a huge thing that's that's lacking in these in these times. We, we can make it happen. We can make it happen. Yeah. Now, let me ask you this. This is a, right along those lines. I'm not trying to cut you off. Well, first of all, this is like a two part question. So have you trained with Bob Stash? Um, what ammo does do, do you use in your um, SPR? He said s.p.r. Oh yeah, s.p.r. I'm not sure. I'm, 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 that's a oh special purpose rifle. <laughs> yeah, what ammo? And uh, will you run for office someday? So there's three questions. <laughs> okay, number one, I, number one, I have not trained with 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 Bob Stash. I've not trained with him. Mm -hmm. What ammo I use? I vary it. I've used anything from. Uh, 62 grain TSX to 75 grain gold dot. To I think you had a, a very detailed video on this subject, didn't you? Yeah, about the rifle. Yeah, just what was it? It's just a scoped AR, man. There's nothing special, and the only purpose is to hit, and it is a rifle. But uh, yeah, I thought uh, you had. I thought you had a video about uh, ammo. Uh, I don't think I don't know if I covered that or not. Oh, I, I've run okay. I've I've run a lot of different loads through it. Um, you yeah. just gotta pick what works best in your rifle. What works best in mine may not work best for yours. Uh, running for office, I don't. I don't really think that that's my calling. Um, I don't think that's my calling at all. Uh, I think, Why? Uh, running for office, man. Um, I mean, you're intelligent. You're educated. You're 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 passionate. You you believe in in what we would like to. You know, you're an American citizen. You're born here. We could push you all the way up to president, man. Yeah, um, man. I'll, I'll tell you, you know, it's it's kind of like this. You know, running for office would be a big sacrifice on my part not just physically but i think emotionally um i mean just doing the youtube thing i mean you get some really great people out there um then you get some other people out there that have uh that have nothing positive to bring to any to anybody's videos they're on the, everybody's videos talking trash they mm -hmm. have nothing positive but if i saw them in person like it, it, would be, it would be the most rewarding experience of my life because there'd be about 20 years worth of aggression taken out on the first <laughs> Um, but you know, you, you see it, in, but no, and all joking. But I think, I, I think you have, I understand where you're coming from, but I think you have something positive to offer, you know, uh, maybe right now you're, you're a young man, you're building things, but as you get older, I think at some point, you know, if, if you're truly a patriot, 
you do have to serve the, your country in some capacity. Now, obviously, you were a Marine, and you did serve your country in that capacity, but... Yeah, I've, I've served, I mean, I've, I've served, uh, I mean, the country at all three levels, federal, state, and local, you know. Uh, I've served it. I've, I've done a lot of those things. I'm not saying that I'm done serving. I just don't think that office, you know, I'm not, I don't have the temperament for it, man. Uh, like, it's like, they're going to want me to compromise, you know, oh, you got to go, don't you think that we should just do, no, I don't think so. I'd be, it, it would be, it would be like, like, uh, and, and, and keep in mind, man, that, uh, you know, running for office, that, that's something that, um, Listen, I, mean, I beg to differ with you, my friend. I beg to differ. You know why? I'm going to tell you. I'm not trying to make you run for office, but I don't think you have to compromise. I think that there's that there's folks out there that, that don't want you to compromise, that want you to get up there and be who you are, be who we know you are, and yeah. stick to your guns and stick to your religion. <laughs> we yeah. want you to do that. Well, you know, back in the day in Congress, you know, a long time ago, they, they used to get in some fights on the floor. and uh, We should bring, did, we should bring that back. I, do, I would bring that tradition back because I'd love to cane Elizabeth Warren's bare end about 16 times from Sunday. Well, do um, you think – so what do you think – this is probably a little bit of history, and you probably know something. You, I guarantee you know something about this. Um, what about duels? Remember duels? Yeah. So, I mean, I don't, I don't know when we took this away, but can we, is, this, is this actually illegal now? It is. It, it's okay. illegal. It, it's. Uh, it was more of. A, it comes from a gentlemanly time. I mean, it came from a time when people valued honor, you know. And if you dishonored or disrespected somebody in public, then you know you had recourse. I mean, th very few duels took place. I mean, there were a lot, but comparatively, very mm -hmm. few took place. I mean, a lot of times the gentleman could reconcile before it came to blows. I mean, a lot of times it would be this. Uh, this gentleman. Oh, are you sure you want to recant your insults? And a lot of times they say, <laughs> "I was in the wrong. I, I apologize." Yeah, yeah. You know, so it was like that. But and it wasn't you know, always to the death, right? It didn't like no, necessarily no, mean no. to the death. No, right. a lot of a lot of times they just shoot and they hit him in the shoulder. Well, you got you know, as the challenge party, you get you get the choice of weapons. Mm -hmm. Um, I, mine. If I got challenged to a duel, I, I would choose sledgehammers and and chest deep <laughs> water. <laughs> you know? uh, but no, in all, in all seriousness, it's funny because. Yeah. Um, I think it's great that that people would uh, would uh, I mean it, it was an older thing. It's it's a way to get honor back, and I, you know, um, it, it is from a time where where people valued reputation and and respectability and everything, and um, and I get where they were coming from doing that, but you know at the same time. Um, you know, it's, it's oftentimes a good old fist fight will suffice. Yeah, you know what I mean. To look, I seriously would like to have duels back. I'm not even kidding. Um, but, you know, as well, I think we lost the art of being able to talk to each other in America. And I mean, people who disagree, you know, it may be easy. You and I, we, we agree, you know, we're pretty much on the same wavelength. But I think you can have discussions with people who are not. Right. And there's a way to go about that. And we seem to not be able to have those kind of discussions in America anymore. Yeah, it's tough. I wish we could get back to that. And um, I wish we could. But Hank, if you want to do uh, one more question, um, yeah, absolutely. Gonna... Yeah, I know we're 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 running down time. So okay, let's. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna try to go through. Um, someone wants to know what your job was in the Marines. I know you kind of rattled that off real fast in the beginning. What was your job in the Marines? Infantry. Infantry. Okay. So basically, what were you getting up to? Well, as far as yeah, in the Marines, like what kind of stuff? I guess that's where they're going. Like you, you know, you were you were out there. Uh, you were actually in combat, right? No, I actually I was active duty. I mean, I was in 0351. I was active duty, forward deployed. Um, I was in from 99 to 03, and and it was weird because uh, you'd think active duty, you know, with the wars in 2001 and 2003, that you get deployed in combat yeah. somewhere, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, I, man, I I was in third battalion, second battalion, third Marines. I was in Kings Bay, uh, Georgia, for uh, you know, garden stuff there. But no, my unit uh, when I was in during that time period, we didn't go anywhere. Yeah, we, we so that didn't. yeah that happened. Someone wants to know: Will you ever hold a class in Vegas? Class in Vegas in conjunction with Rifle Dynamics, and that was last November. I don't travel. Um, yes. It's it's just not. I, I'm not doing the road show. If you, if people want to train, um, that's why we built the facility that we built is to to be able to run the classes that we want without interference. So if people want to train, you know, Tennessee's and we're and we're near any you know we're near. Atlanta, I mean. 
we're off 75, 40, 81. I mean, there's three major interstates there. And as far as, you know, airports, you know, you can fly into Atlanta and, and or you can fly into Knoxville or Asheville and, and you're close by. Yeah. Look up Valor Ridge and you guys will be able to find that. When when Reed was actually in Vegas, that's a very rare occurrence. I was actually there at the same time and yeah. it was so crazy <laughs> that we did not see each other. I wanted to, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that, that kind of thing happens. All right. So you know what? I want to, I want to, there, there was a lot of questions. I think someone was asking about like you know what do you advise for a brand new gun can you over set up your rifle i don't know if you want to hit that real quick before I, got, I, wrap. I got all kinds of videos about all yeah. that stuff. yeah yeah reed has some some cool videos about this kind of stuff can folks like how if they wanted to get you to do a video on a subject how can they kind of like submit that to you like ideas obviously you're not going to do everything but no i can't i really i don't have time a lot of times i mean i used to do it one a week but i i just don't have time to do that so i try to do you know one every other week or so but uh, yeah, video ideas, you know, on the Facebook page, man. Um, yeah. Usually, if I'm out there, and you know, I, I'll put out like the latest video. Of, you know, people want whatever they want to see next in the comments section. Say, hey, man, could you do a video about this, or could you do a video about this? You know, we try to do it, and I, I welcome you know video ideas as long as it's not you know too crazy of a topic. Absolutely. Just um, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap this up. Um, Valor Ridge, right? You're on your. You've got a website, and you're on Facebook. That's it. Yeah, so Valor Ridge, it's, it's easy to find if you search it. You By the time you get Valor in there and you put the R, it starts popping up. Yeah. So just uh, hit up Reed. Uh, we're going to leave some links here. There definitely is a link in the video right now. I want to thank Reed for coming on. I think Patriot Nurse fell asleep back there. Did she? No, she's actually she's actually got the dinner. Uh, oh, dinner. <laughs> yeah, you got to eat. We have to let him go and eat. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thanks a lot for coming on, man. Um, you know, we've been friends for a long time, and I really appreciate your friendship. Oh, same here. Same here. You're, you're a very nice guy, good dude, and uh, I really look forward to seeing you here in a couple short months. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to it, man. Um, say good night to Patriot Nurse for us, and let her know I'm serious about having her come on. I will, and I'm sure she'd love that, and tell Lola I said hello, and hopefully yeah. she'll be able to make it with you, too. Right. So that just hold on a second there. I'm going to end this. I want to thank everyone for watching all the folks out there that support us. Um, you know, we, we really do need your support out there. If you want to help us out, Patreon slash Hank Strange is how you help us out. Also, we've got some people that sponsor us and that would be Rand CLP, Andrew's Custom Leather, and of course, Safety Harbor Firearms, as well as the podcast, which is put on by Big Daddy Guns. So I want to thank everyone for watching. Peace.